Good day, brothers and sisters. This is The Other Paul, and we're back for another awesome interview on a very fascinating topic. And I'm joined by my friend Seth from Scholastic Lutheran. Seth, how are you going this fine Australian morning? Fine Australian morning. Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Over here in Michigan, it's a, it's a nice evening, actually. Very, very good weather right now. I see, I see. Well, as we, as we all know, all other time zones that aren't Sydney time are just fan fictions of the real thing. But anyway, <laughs> to move on from that, <laughs> um, I think a lot of us in these circles will probably know at least something about the Scholastic Lutherans, but maybe a bunch of us also do not. So Seth, can you introduce yourself and Scholastic Lutherans for us? Yeah, so uh, Scholastic Lutherans is a, mm. uh, or a collaborative channel. I'm one of the members. Um, it was actually Jared's idea originally. Uh, he's one of the other members. Jared uh, messaged me. We knew each other from college. Um, and he said, hey, it'd be, it'd be a good idea to like start a YouTube channel or something of that sort. And so we uh, got a few other people together in on it because we both knew we didn't have enough time just between the two of us to like make consistent content. And the algorithm likes, uh, you know, like weekly uploads. So we figured we'd get a few other people in on it. And then between everyone, we could, you know, pump out videos uh, on a weekly basis of some sort, at least. So uh, Scholastic Lutherans uh, pretty much is uh, an approach to Lutheran theology uh, directed towards lay people, not necessarily at a low level. Some of the videos are more complex topics, mm -hmm. but uh, we're not like addressed at like pastors or anything in particular, but we're more just interested at getting Lutheran orthodoxy into the hands of, uh, you know, everyday people and specifically from a more scholastic perspective. So we're talking uh, realist epistemology, realist metaphysics, um, and a systematic approach to questions and answers. Uh, I guess Excellent. you want to know about me. I guess yeah, I live in Michigan, uh, north of Detroit, and uh, I'm a Lutheran, LCMS. There you go. Excellent stuff. Now, this interview, at least for me, is fairly unique because they're normally just purely topical. And this one is topical, but this interview is also um, unique in that it's not just a topic, but promoting a particular book. Can you introduce that for us? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is the, so Scholastic Lutherans, uh, we wanted to do like uh, publishing efforts. Um, and uh, so we we have a, a couple of things in the works already. Um, this is one of the first things um, that we put out, or actually rather the first thing, but a couple other things on the way still. Uh, and that is uh, my first book. I authored this one. And it is Against the Invocation of Saints. And the subtitle is uh, rather long. An Apology for the Protestant Doctrine of Prayer over and against the doctrine of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, so it's, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily mean it's not uh, helpful against Roman Catholics or Oriental Orthodox or any of these other groups. But it's uh, specifically addressing the Eastern Orthodox because they aren't really addressed as much in Protestant literature. Yeah, that makes sense. And that was, I was pretty much going to ask that immediately, but you got that already. Like, why specifically Eastern Orthodoxy and not just East and Rome kind of lumped together? Uh, maybe we can get into the distinctives once we get underway. Yeah. But for people who are interested in this book, you can check the description down below and you can buy it uh, from a couple of different links, uh, most particularly from Lulu. So if you, you can go over to either of those sites and you can buy this book right now, only 22 Australian dollars, which is pretty good. Um, although the book is fairly short. So uh, uh, I guess that's just uh, that's just the nature of shipping and inflation on our end. So uh, rip. Yep. <laughs> but in any case, people go along, buy the book. Um, it is genuinely a great read. I can attest to that. Um, it's simple, gets right to the point, doesn't dilly dally. And oh, look, this scholar says this. It just gets right to the primary sources and just talks, just hits at them straight away. So even though it is fairly short, only 162 pages, it is in fact very dense. And you'll be able to tell that immediately from the table of contents. Um, so please do pick that up if you're interested in this topic. And uh, with that said, we will now move on to the meat itself. <clears throat> so um, actually, uh, I'll, I'll commence with why for your first ever book, because obviously that's a big thing. And I've got a couple of different ideas slash projects. And I'm kind of thinking like, which one do I want me to be my first one? Why did you choose this topic as your first book? So uh, I talk about this in the introduction of the book. We, um, I had a few friends uh, who were Lutheran and uh, formerly went to the same church as I do. And um, one of them converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. And um, I, I don't want to say it was completely uh, sudden, but it was to a degree. Um, and then 
shortly after another friend, uh, one from the same friend group in the same church, um, also converted. Uh, so from the Lutheran to Eastern Orthodox pipeline is kind of like, it's a thing. Um, it's been going on like for a while. Uh, so it's, you know, big names are like Yaroslav Pelikan, who's a very famous mm -hmm. scholar. Um, and another, uh, big example would be actually, um, pastor, uh, Fenton, who was the pastor at my church. Um, not while I was there. Uh, this was quite a while ago, but, uh, he was another big name. Um, Will Whedon, who is, I think he's still the worship director of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. If not, he was formerly at least. Um, so pretty big, pretty high up. He, uh, also, uh, considered converting and then, uh, didn't, and then wrote some stuff about why you shouldn't convert. Um, so it's kind of like a thing that's been happening. Uh, I mean, I think it kind of makes sense that you have a you people, you have people who want to be more traditional. Um, they're not convinced of a lot of Roman claims. And so they're, they're Lutheran and then they get, uh, very much interested in patristics, um, tradition. They, uh, you know, go from there into, you know, having a higher view of tradition than Lutherans would typically have. We have a high view of tradition, but we don't put it, you know, at the same level as scripture, uh, or we don't kind of say scripture is part of tradition, things like that. And they uh, go east for, you know, historical reasons, or um, perhaps they, you know, think that it's the true church, things like this. Um, so there's kind of like this pipeline that already existed. And so uh, when my friend, my second friend converted, uh, me and another one of my friends, actually two other of them, really three, so three Lutherans, um, we kind of had like a meeting with him to before, this is like right before he's about to convert, but he's like telling us he's thinking of converting. And we tried to answer a lot of his questions. I just spent like a whole week of work, not really doing work. Uh, this is an old job and I really did not have much work to do at this job. I would like ask my bosses for things to do and I just wouldn't get anything. Um, and so I just like spent the entire time instead just working on uh, like answering the questions. So I gave him like a 20 page single spaced eight and a half. Oh, oh dear. We like met with him. Uh, super, super sorry, Seth, you, you, your voice froze. You, you voice, you froze for like five or so seconds. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Back up to the 20 page thing. So yep. we, yeah, we brought the thing, uh, the 20 page response uh, with my three friends. We talked to him. Uh, he still ended up converting, but I think mm. one of the big things was um, we realized like there weren't many resources uh, on this. So when I was approaching this question of the Eastern Orthodox and like, how do we respond to them? It's, it's not easy really, because there's not just a lot out there. There are a lot of like blog posts. There's a few journal articles here and there, things like that. Um, but there weren't a lot of resources directly addressing it. There are um, a couple dialogues that happened, some in the 16th century and then some more modern ones. And I did. Re oh, froze up again. Oh, this is weird. I'm on Ethernet. Hmm, that's a little strange. You know, it was, it was yeah. only a brief freezing up. So, yeah, be yeah good. plug direct. I'm not even like Ethernet to wall. I'm directly plugged in. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't, something's going on. Um, oh, actually, let it's, me. Uh, I, I might it's... know what that is. It's the power mites. They're trying to stop this from happening. No, I think I know what it is. Um, one second. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was running a lot of high software stuff in the background. <laughs> they're sucking up RAM. I have like a lot of RAM, but it was too much. Okay. Um, but there's not a lot on it. And so we actually started a project that is, and I mentioned this in the book, but we started a much larger project to try and like pretty much be something kind of like the examination of the Council of Trent, but in response to the Eastern Orthodox. Okay. Um, so we were going to systematically go through all the topics um, and respond to the Eastern Orthodox positions on them wow. in defense of specifically the Lutheran positions. Wow. Okay. So this book is just one, doc, pretty much the first part of that. Yep, exactly. So we'll see if any of the other ones come out. I mean, I hope they do. Um, they've mm. got, it's kind of been put on pause, but that that's where that's what generated the book. This was one little locus in the large document. Um, mm. The rest of the document has a lot of outlines. It actually has a few arguments fleshed out in some sections, but nothing that's <laughs> like uh, edited in, in, into a nice book yet. Maybe you should call it, maybe you should collate the whole thing into a mega volume once they're all done and call it the examination of the Council of Jerusalem. Just a thought. <laughs>
Um, but can you, this is, this is a very important question here. My friend, Steve Christie here. Can you confirm this is the Will Wheaton from Star Trek? <laughs> no, I've, I've actually never watched Star Trek, but uh, Jared is a big Star Trek person. Good. Uh, You're pure. So Jared, Jared will appreciate that. <laughs> very nice. Wow. Hello. Max Confessor, $19 Super Chat. Mate, thank you so much. Author gang rising, Jeremiah's the second gang. Okay. Very interesting. A man giving money to free <laughs> a against his position I, I admirable thank you so much i'm not going to complain thank you i hugely appreciate that super chat my dude um so with that uh we got a we got a few people already uh, showing interest we got pog my man here he's saving it to his list lutheran hub they're going to be buying it as well um so god willing uh this stream will be able to get the word out there get the book going get get some sales happening through lulu or amazon or what have you um but in any case to get to the book itself so uh, before I even address any specific arguments, what was the order or method of your book? How did you, how did you actually want to work through the topic by way of method? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I do after giving an introduction, which is mostly what the stuff I just explained about, you know, why did I write the book? Um, how did it come to be? After that, uh, I hop right into just laying out the positions. So I kind of thought of this almost like a debate where it's, you know, lay out your opening. Uh, position, uh, define every term. Uh, so I give, you know, the Lutheran position from the Lutheran confessions. I quote the Lutheran confessions and I provide all the citations. Um, and then I also uh, go into a couple of tangential matters that are like, related, like, okay, we do believe the saints pray for us in heaven, but that doesn't, but we reject that we should pray to them. Yeah. And also Lutherans or affirm, Lutheran. well, at least we permit, I should say, we don't like, we don't obligate people to this. But it's in our confessions that we say you can pray for the faithful departed. This would be something like, uh, you know, uh, we we commend to uh, you this person that they may rest in peace with you. So something along yeah. those lines. I gave a, a specific quote from Luther um, that he provides a prayer like this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's a there's a prayer in our liturgy actually, um, at least at my church, that is specifically for this, um, commending those who have gone before us to God that they may have a place of rest, quietness, and peace, which I believe mm. comes from the Roman canon. Um, so Lutherans aren't obligated to do that, but it is something we say you can do. Mm. Um, so I go into a couple of tangential matters, and then I go to the or Eastern Orthodox position, and I lay out their position from official sources. Um, they don't have like a set, you know, like confession like Lutherans do. Um, they have some things that are like, you know, you have Dositheus and Philaret, um, the Council of Jerusalem. So you have uh, these various documents that are largely considered uh, binding. And mm. you also have liturgy. Uh, and for Eastern Orthodox, liturgy is everything. Uh, yeah. That's really their confession. Um, so the, you know, everything that's the, the Bible and the church fathers and the liturgy are kind of all wrapped up for them as part of tradition, as one yeah. big kind of clump. And so the, uh, I go through a lot of prayers actually and particularly prayers um, that are either from highly regarded saints um, that would be prayed specifically in public contexts, uh, and also things like the Akavist to the Theotokos, which is part of the liturgy annually that you would pray every single year. Uh, so this would not be something, this is not something fringe or unusual. This is something that if you're going to standard services, you're praying this. Um, and for them, that is considered, uh, I mean, Lex Rondi, Lex Credendi. I mean, I think yes. this uh, would apply in the uh, West too. We might have a different way of mm. putting it and categorizing things, but uh, you know, I'm not going to be disagreeing with any of you know the collects in the in the Lutheran hymnal or something. I mean, mm. those are all good yeah. collects. Right. Uh, but the Eastern prayers are very long. Uh, you know, the Western mm. liturgy is is kind of shorter and a little more compartmentalized. The Eastern liturgy, I mean, there's a reason they chant it so fast. If you've ever been to one, it's it's real quick. Oh yeah, <laughs> those guys are. <laughs> they they have a lot of words to say, and people don't you know. They know people don't want to be in church for three hours on a Sunday morning, like just in the service, mm. uh, you know, so they, they say things pretty quickly. And so there's a lot you might miss if you're not, you know, paying really close attention. Um, but I, I use those as the sources for the official, you know, dogma of the Eastern Orthodox Church and go through some of the more extreme examples, I'd say. Mm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Would you like it if, because I saw access to the doc, would you like it if I shared and showed the uh, table of contents? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Excellent. So if anyone who's interested, when I when I say that this thing's got a beefy table of contents for a book only of 167 pages, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's 
literally three pages of a table of contents. The guy's, the guy's gone to some absolutely uh, ridiculous detail in outlining exactly where you can find everything. So it's extremely useful. You can see the systematic layout of the book, starting with definitions, of course, good old prolegomena. We, we all shout out to all the prolegomena boys out there. We love that stuff. And then getting into the meat of it, going through scripture, going through the fathers and then addressing objections. That's pretty much an order I like to do myself with my own work. So I'm very, I'm very, very much appreciative of this. Um, so yes, people take a look at that table of contents and uh, God willing, it'll interest you and uh, then go ahead and buy it. I know certainly I will be buying it myself because I always, for books, I can get a, there's one thing to get a digital copy of something and my, my one uh, that I have here is only temporary. Um, but even if I could get a digital copy of something, if I really, really, really like a book, I'll get a physical one as well. This is definitely one of those. So I'll be ordering that as soon as I have the spare cash, God willing. Now, um, with that case, with the purpose of the book done, why it was made, uh, and with the method you followed, let's get right into the meat of it, I think. So um, what is the key biblical evidence uh, for your position, for what you uh, assert against the Orthodox? And um, well, I'll, I'll let you do that first, and then we can talk about objections. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the yeah, as you showed in the book, so after defining positions, it's, it's pretty much just, here's the Lutheran position, the defense, uh, arguments against the opposing position, and then objections. So, you know, very, very systematic. You can probably see a little bit of scholastic influence in there. Oh, yeah. um, so obviously there's the standard proof texts of Christ being our mediator. And particularly mm -hmm. uh, the you have the passage in um, First Timothy where Christ is the sole mediator. You have passages about the spirit being our advocate. Um, you also have passages about them being intercessors for us. Um, yep. That is the Christ and the spirit, not uh, saints. And so the the basic part of the beginning of the argument is just okay we have christ as a mediator and he's a perfect mediator and we know that we can go to christ when we're in sin because in first john it, it talks about going to christ boldly and specifically when we're in sin that's the whole point of the message there in that passage mm -hmm. um and so the the first part of the of the argument is simply okay we have christ as a perfect mediator so why why go to the saints um, now that's not necessarily the most convincing argument to everyone, uh, sure, but I think it's a good like start spot to start and the standard argument that pretty much all the Protestant reformers go to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's if you go to any of their books, uh, even into the scholastic period where they're being more advanced arguments. I mean, that's that's the bread and butter of the of the introduction. Yeah. Um, the next part of the argument is that prayer is only to God alone. And I go to a number of passages, and we can we can look at some of those passages if we'd like, but there are a lot of passages in Scripture that say that God alone is our help, our safety, our defense. Um, and the, the word alone is specifically used in here. Um, so I go into Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic in the book and, you know, pretty much do word studies on these, on the phrases being used in context of prayer and things like that, where it says that God alone is these things for us. So if God alone is our help or our safety, our defense, etc., then... How can, you know, we be going to saints for these things, you know, more angels, etc. And obviously God uses mediating uh, figures for things, but we have no evidence. We don't have any particular evidence in scripture that we've been given that, uh, that these saints in heaven have been given these abilities to help us in these specific, specific ways. Um, so that if, if the opposing side wants to show that, they need to prove it from the early sources. And I get into early sources later in the book discussing uh, you know, the usual early claims and also going into later sources and also looking at claims that from early sources that seem to be objecting to it. Mm. Excellent. Uh, the, yeah. oh, good. I'm oh, sorry. Keep going. I, you just had a pause there. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so after I go through that, I also go through prayer as worship. Um, so in, one of the arguments I make is pretty much, well, if prayer is worship and worship's only to God, then we can only pray to God. It seems pretty simple. Um, I go through, I don't know, a dozen or so passages that are very clearly seem to be conflating prayer and worship, where the terms seem to be used interchangeably in the passages. Or, yep. you know, it will say they prayed, and then the next spot will say, mm. we'll call this what they just did, worship. What's Things one like of your that? favorite passages to that effect of prayer equals worship? Sure. I'll give you a, I'll give you a, just, I'll, I'll grab the first one off the page. <clears throat> Actually, wait, let me grab a, let me see if I can. 
pick one in particular. The first one's probably not the best example. I can I go through them in order. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe a strange one, but I think it does do it. I think this does uh, actually give a great example of uh, why this is. So this is, yeah, we'll use this one for now. So this mm -hmm. is from the old Greek version of Bell and the Dragon, which might seem like a strange one, but I think it illustrates the point very well, and it's short, which is good for a stream. Um, <laughs> so in the old Greek version of Bell and the Dragon, so this is from you know apocryphal section of Daniel, but the Eastern Orthodox consider that authoritative. So mm -hmm. um, this, I think, is actually not bad. It reads as this. And the king would revere him, that is Bell. Uh, this is Bell as his idol. And the king would go every day and would do obeisance to him. But Daniel would pray to the Lord. And the king said to Daniel, why do you not do obeisance to Bell? Now, that seems like, okay, what's this passage have to do with anything about the subject? But the first do obeisance, as it's being translated here, this is a New English translation of the Septuagint is the first time it's used is the word for to bow proskuneo mm -hmm. if i'm pronouncing my greek right which i probably not maybe proskuneo um it depends on you say right that's to bow uh and the second example of <laughs> do obeisance in that verse is more so to pray prosukomai which is the standard word for praying so we have an example here where in the verse it's saying why do you why do you not uh, worship the God and instead pray to your God? Hmm. So the words are being used interchangeably there, which yep. I think demonstrates that the Greek, um, those two Greek terms are fairly interchangeable in religious context like this. And it even actually kind of shows another thing as well, because you have with the second council in Nicaea, they have the heavy emphasis on how you have your Latria, which is the God alone, but then your proskuneo, your, your um, veneration, that can go for other others apart from God, although it's ultimately still directed to God through them. Um, but yet here you have that term, and there's many such examples in the Old Testament um, and, and even in the New Testament of that term proskuneo in reference to worship proper. So that, it, it shows that as well. Yep. And th there's a, I go through a whole section on incense as well to demonstrate this mm. and also sacrifices. Mm. And so worship and sacrifices are obviously tied. I don't think anybody denies that. In fact, usually the objection is, well, we pray to the saints, but we don't sacrifice to them. Uh, that's a common uh, response. But I do demonstrate in a number of passages that prayer and sacrifice are very intimately tied through the whole inter yep. uh, Old Testament system. Uh, and I also go into incense in particular, because incense and prayer, everybody knows those are connected, right? Let my mm -hmm. prayers rise before thee as incense. And the New Testament, when Zacharias, the priest, is in the temple in the beginning of uh, Luke, it's, uh, you know, he's giving incense to God and praying. Uh, so I don't think anybody denies that those are tightly tied together. Yep. But then you look at other passages where incense and worship are tightly tied together, and there doesn't seem to be any distinction. Yep. So it suggests that, you know, giving incense, praying, worshiping, all one thing, or one thing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess you kind of touched on... Uh on a bit of the Eastern Orthodox uh, objection on objections to that. Um, but what would you say uh, in their, let's say one of their objections, uh, their alleged proof texts for the, um, for the uh, says in your, in your thing specifically examples of scripture from the, they're, they're what they propose as proof text for the um, intercession of saints and angels in response to that. How would you, how would you get back? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm looking in the book, by the way. That's why I'm looking down. Uh, sure. just, I don't have all the passages yeah, memorized. I mean, I go through, I actually, I didn't make a scriptural index. I considered doing it, but I really wanted to get the book out because um, I was busy with other things and uh, I was going to be very busy with other things. And so I wanted to get the book out. I didn't make a scriptural index, but I cite, I don't know how many verses I have in here. Uh, I nearly worked, reached out to Thomas Nelson because I was worried, oh, I don't know if I have more than 250 verses cited. And you have to like ask them. Uh, so please don't be a report me if I happen to have more than 250 verses cited in here, but there are a lot, so I don't have them all memorized, but, um, some of the examples that they use are, uh, Psalm 103 and 148 or the Greek version of Daniel three. These are passages that say things like this. This is Psalm 103, uh, bless the Lord, you as angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word, bless the Lord, all you as hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Or in 148, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts, 
Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light, etc. Um, so in the Greek, Daniel passage is the same type of thing. Uh, yeah. So the point that they use here, this is a, one of the most common ones, is they say, look, uh, these are passages that are asking the angels and the hosts and all of the creation to uh, bless the Lord or praise the Lord. Well, okay, sh sure. I mean, like, we're fine with using this type of language, um, but we would say this is literary apostrophe, meaning you're speaking of something as if it can hear you, even though it's not something that can actually hear you. Yep. And I think that's particularly clear in the 148 passage where it says, uh, praise him, all you stars of light and heavens and heavens and waters above the heavens. Okay, so can hmm. water above the heavens, can the firmament pray for us then? Do we invoke the firmament uh, is pr pretty much the counter argument. Uh, so we're fine with using literary apostrophe, um, but we wouldn't say that's grounds for actual invocation, you know, asking yep. saints to help us or even asking saints to pray for us if we're taking a more moderate approach. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the probably the most common one you'll see as a biblical proof text as an actual example of supposedly invoking something. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it actually kind of throws a bit of a spanner in the works from from just thinking of it now. I, I wonder what your thoughts are. Um, because their whole thing, because one of the common counters is that, oh, well, if it's only, um, if you're only doing veneration, it's so that it's not idolatry, you're only venerating a saint, or you're only, like, you're praying to them in a venerative sense, not in a latria sense. Um, does that mean, therefore, it's okay to pray to other false gods and idols and all that? And they'll say, obviously not, because they're, um, because they're false gods or whatever, um, to which you can then reply, well, okay, but if you're going to be equivocating between your idea of invocation of the saints, which you say you can't do with false gods, um, and this uh, uh, apostrophe idea of um, of telling all the angels bless the Lord and all that stuff, uh, in that the, in that case, by your own system, you would actually impute scripture itself with uh, illicit veneration of the false gods, because there's multiple scriptures where the pe where the writers say. Uh, all you, all you gods, bow down before Yahweh and all that stuff. So they're, they're actually, in in a way, speaking to them, saying, "Hey, do that." So by their own logic, if they're going to do that, if they're going to equivocate, then oh dear, we got a problem. <laughs> what, what do you think of that? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so interesting uh, case. So in the Greek Daniel passage, uh, one of the things that is uh, invoked, if we will, if we're going to say it's invocation, is specifically the moon. Uh, and mm -hmm. the Greek Daniel passage, if you, I guess it, it depends how you take Greek Daniel. If you take it, be written by Daniel or a little bit later, uh, like in the Second Temple period. But uh, either way, this might hold up. In Second Temple literature, the moon itself is said to fall. And so if you're going to read, you know, the Bible, and if you're going to read that passage in context of its other near, like other Jewish literature from this literature from the same time, well, then you're going to, you're going to be saying, okay, well, you're invoking a demon uh, to, <laughs> to praise God. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, that would, so there is it, it's not, it's not a horrible example. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, hundred percent. And that's in a four Baruch, I believe. Not not Baruch chapter four, but I believe that's in four Baruch. Um, mm. Don't yeah. quote me on that. It's in one of those. It's in one of the apocalyptic uh, Baruch passages. Yeah, sure. And we know the EOs; they're all they're all for that kind of stuff. So it shouldn't be a shouldn't be an issue of authority, I guess. Um, but by the way, bef just before, just a very quick aside um, for people out there, put in your questions, or rather, hang on, this one. Put in your questions for the Q&A at the end of this, which we will have uh, super chats and subscribe star supporters will have priority. So if you're one of those, get stuff in right now because I do expect we may have a few questions. We already have a couple of questions lined up that I've got uh, starred on the side so that I can call them up later. But put in your questions whenever you want. Put it with a Q and a colon so that I can tell immediately that it's a question and then I'll immediately save it and be able to bring it up in the Q&A. Now, with that said, let us continue. Um, so I'm thinking on this stuff. So on the biblical evidence in particular, you, you have, you devote a, a fairly large section or significant section, um, to the Eastern hermeneutic of their heavy reliance on typology. Um, so could you describe that for us, how they use that, um, and then go into the problems with that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the, I, I don't devote about I don't know, 12 pages, which it's not a long book, like we said. So that's a, a decent portion is to the typology yeah. question. And um, let me see if I can actually find the section. I believe it's 10. Yeah, there's 102. Um, so the typology section, there are two like types that are typically given as examples. And 
one of them you'll rec well people will recognize on the stream probably if they follow youtube theology at all um one of them is i do actually touch on the eliakim argument in here not for Ooh. the papacy thing but just as an example of okay well the prime minister in the old testament um this prime minister figure if we want to call him that he uh he did like intercede to the king on behalf of other people uh mm -hmm. and i go through one of the examples in scripture of that well the only example that happens um and the more common one you'll see however is this one where uh solomon's mother the queen mother or mother queen uh intercedes to solomon and this is the one that's typically used they say look solomon uh listens to his mother therefore we should pray to mary and jesus will listen to us because we're you know requesting for his mother yeah. Yeah. and mary's nice and you know jesus is angry um not everyone uses that example but they're some of the examples i use in the introduction or not the introduction the definitions are very clearly um uh, going in that direction yeah uh, quite strongly um specifically the uh the canon of Theodore the Studite, um, who is one of their foremost saints. Um, he is a pre schism saint, but uh, I don't, I, I wouldn't call him a saint. Uh, <laughs> but the Eastern Orthodox do. Um, so they, I'll give you the first example. Um, so the first example with the Mary, uh, the Mary parallel is from 1 Kings 2. Uh, so Bathsheba is used typologically. Um, I won't read through the entire passage because it's actually uh, rather, it's, it, not that long, but it's, it's, you know, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing. But uh, what happens is uh, the throne is trying to be taken from Solomon. And uh, there's, a, there's a family relation here where uh, it's pretty much his, one of his brothers, I believe, if I look back at the passages, I'd see one of his brothers is trying to take the throne. He goes through Bathsheba to try and get to uh, Solomon. Well, what happens is Bathsheba requests to Solomon. So Bathsheba is being the intercessor here in the in-between. But uh, it doesn't get answered how uh, it, you'd, you'd want it to. So Bathsheba relays it, and Solomon pretty much just rejects it outright. So my first objection here is, okay, if this is being used as an example of uh, intercession yeah. or how we should invoke, <laughs> well, like this is the typology. Well, then all I'm hearing is if I go to Mary, then God's Jesus is going to say, nope, I'm not. I'm not accepting that. I'm just going to reject it. And so then my prayers are just being rejected. I don't think that's like, to me, that seems like a very weak typology to actually use an example where sure, I guess, I guess Jesus would hear it and then he would reject my prayer. I don't think that's helpful <laughs> with them at all, really, honestly, yeah. but this is a common example and nobody seems to actually read the whole passage and come to that, like actually mm. get to the end and be like, yeah. Oh yeah, it didn't actually work. Yeah. Uh, that's that's not the a good method. Yeah. And that's the, that's the fundamental flaw because like obviously i've done a bit on this particularly the whole alike debacle when that came out um that's the fundamental flaw of typological interpretation is that you have to when it's based on a bare typology and it's not rooted in a in a literal passage somewhere or other um you have to arbitrarily stop it somewhere because if you just let it run its course you'll create absolute chaos i mean we could a more faithful typology of this would be that if you uh, pray to God through Mary, he's going to send an angel of death to strike you dead. That's a bit more yeah, accurate. I mean, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, look at the result at the end. Shall we put to death today? <laughs> I mean, this really exactly. does not go well. Um, so th that's the first example. The other example is is the prime minister, but the prime minister example really fails because the one example of this that we have is a foreigner, so a, a non-Jew. So this is a non-believer. The non-believer is going through the prime minister to talk to the king. So this would hmm. work perhaps if people were saying that unbelievers could invoke saints to talk to the king, I suppose. Hmm. But we don't have any examples of, you know, an Israelite going to the prime minister to talk to the king. Now, obviously, like, that's how this is like, there are all sorts of political situations where that would just be a normal thing that would happen. Of course, you go through, you know, the secretary or something to talk to the yes. person higher up. That's very normal. But to sit, to try and use a passage as a typological grounds for this, you need a you need an actual cohesive picture, not example of an unbeliever talking to a prime minister to talk to a king, and to use that as justification for well, therefore we should pray to Peter. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's no example in the New Testament of either of these being like very tightly tied in a nice way to make this work. Um, and I, one of the arguments I make is that both Augustine and Origen 
both go through a long section of explaining how you can use typology and both of them pretty much say okay yeah for if you're just like making a nice parallel you might be able to do this in a sermon things like that you can use a type that's not explicit in the new testament mm. and there are like there are a number of parallels like that in the old testament and new testament of course there's typology but to try and use it as grounds for a doctrine they both yeah. say you can't do that unless there's explicit new testament grounds for it yeah. that says this is a type like yeah. the ark and the ark of the or that's the boat that noah's on not the ark of the covenant but the ark with noah and his family is a type of baptism and you know because it's in the flood there's water water another example is going through the red sea also type of baptism but there's obviously like not a lot of one-to-ones here so you have to be really careful with how tightly you want to use these the ark is keeping people out of the water baptism is going into the water same with the red sea being parted the Red Sea's parted. Israel goes through the Red Sea. That's a type of baptism, but they're specifically not getting wet. So uh, in both these cases, you have to be really careful with how you're going to apply typology because the New Testament, uh, it's not always super clear that, okay, here's the obvious typologies and here aren't unless it's told to us. And so if we're going to stick to, you know, how the, at least Augustine and Origen say to use typology, we can't uh, overstretch this into a grounds for doctrine. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> um, and I was going to look at, there was another thing I was going to look at in this particular one. Actually, an objection I sometimes hear myself, uh, I don't know if you look at that in the book or not, but I even just out of pure curiosity, because sometimes I'll hear uh, not just EOs, but also uh, Romanists. And I remember hearing this from uh, Michael Lofton once as well. He had a stream on it um, where he tries to argue that, um, <clears throat> that the uh, apostles themselves, when arguing, with unbelieving Gentiles or Jews, that they would appeal to typology to demonstrate their positions. Uh, have you ever explored that? And uh, if so, would you have a response to that? Or uh, I have not explored that in particular, so I, I, I wouldn't really have much of a response without looking into it more. <laughs> no, fair <laughs> enough. Not, not, not on the spot, at least. Maybe I no, no, totally fair enough. Totally fair enough. <laughs> uh, I can briefly say, I haven't looked at it myself, that, it's, that they don't quite do that. Like, yeah, they do make typological connections, but they don't solely rest on it. They'll also rely they'll fundamentally rely on literal prophecy, um, what they claim to be literal prophecy, as well as their own testimony as, hey, Christ rose from the dead and this fulfills that. So it's not like they're looking at a bare typology and like, oh, look, Jesus rising from the dead would make sense because here's this typological thing we just came up with, but rather they are saying Jesus did rise from the dead. We attest to that. That is a fact, a literal fact. And this typologically fits in this way. So there's, there's a difference. Yeah. But I was just curious. I'm fine anyway. with using typology. I, like I'm fine with using typology as an mm. argument, but only if it's like, it has to be a supporting argument pretty much. Yes, if you exactly. have five reasons for something being very clearly true in scripture, then sure. You can add on, you know, two or three typological arguments at the end. And, you know, it's the cherry on top and that's neat, but I would never use it as the grounds for the actual doctrine. If there isn't clear support otherwise. Um, and that's exactly what Augustine origins point is. They don't say you can't do that ever. They just say you yep. can't use it for grounding a doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Um, you also, um, very, very interesting. You seem to make an argument that at least in biblical terms, this, uh, this seems to be uh, potentially related to necromancy, this practice. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So the necromancy argument is pretty short, but, um, so I, I would never use this as the opener in the argument simply because it's, I think it's one of the weaker ones, but I do think it's a legitimate argument for a couple of reasons. Um, pretty much my argument is this is something close or parallels necromancy mm. in some yeah. ways, which, okay. I mean, like just talking to someone it, normally, just, you know, me talking to you or talking to someone who's right next to me. Sure. We're both talking and they're people. Therefore it's like, like necromancy or something. So they're like, yeah, that's, Obviously, that would be like a way more extreme example of pulling something out. But my point is, okay, no, it's not the exact same as necromancy, but there are some parallels. And necromancy is very clearly condemned a lot of times in the Old Testament with I, its death is the is the punishment for necromancy. So my point is we should be really cautious in doing things that are somewhat similar to necromancy. So I obviously provide the... the uh, Punishments for necromancy, Leviticus 20, 27. It's punishable by stoning. Yeah. Um, but I also go into an example specifically in Isaiah where the inherent problem is not communicating uh, with the dead on the behalf of the living because that's one of the common responses 
is okay this isn't necromancy because necromancy is trying to get powers from the dead or it's trying to uh the problem is more about uh you know uh contacting them through specific means or something my point is no no the actual problem is you're communicating with the dead on behalf of the living and my justification for this is isaiah 819 which is and i quote and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? And so Isaiah's argument here is, okay, uh, if they're dead, then you know you shouldn't be communicating with them on behalf of the living. And the obviously the objection is they're not dead, they're alive, they're more alive than we are. Of course, yes, they are. I go into actually an argument about super vivification, which is just a term I use to say super alive, right? Super vivification, over alive, uh, to say they're more alive than us. I go through that argument later in the book at one point. Yeah. Um, my point is that it, the problem seems to be communicating with those in Sheol on behalf of those who are alive. And the best example we have of this in the Old Testament is obviously Samuel, right? Mm. Saul yeah. uh, <clears throat> goes, to the, goes to the medium, the witch of Endor, as it said, and brings up Samuel. And you could debate about whether that's actual, actually Samuel or not. Uh, Sirach says it is, but if you don't think Sirach has authority, you can argue it isn't, those types of things. Um, but regardless, that's the old, that's like the closest example we have. And Samuel is a saint. Uh, yeah. So, and that's obviously condemned. I mean, read the passage with the witch of Endor. I mean, this is not a good thing that happens. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the problem doesn't necessarily specifically mean okay don't go through mediums because isaiah says it, the problem is communicating with the dead on behalf of the living the response well they're not dead okay well there's a problem here still because samuel is a saint and so or you know if you want to call him uh was it that or orthodox call the old testament saints um not blessed i forget righteous you know, righteous samuel okay this i don't see how this quite works here because samuel is a saint and that was a problem communicating with him too uh, mm. I also point out that Justin Martyr, Justin Martyr just lumps together evoking saints with necromancy. Uh, well, I mean, he doesn't say saints, but he the I can give you the quote here. Mm. Evoking of departed human souls is the is the phrase he uses. Yeah. And he lumps the same with necromancy, divin uh, divinations, magi, dream senders, and assistant spirits or familiars. So my point is that okay evoking departed souls is lumped in with these other activities in mm -hmm. just a martyr and he calls this necromancy at the beginning of the quote so yeah. it seems to me that the problem with necromancy is not the parallels are not avoided by the typical justifications for avoiding it i don't think they're the exact same thing by any means yeah. but i do think there are too many parallels and necromancy is punishable by stoning and so we should really be careful if we're going to uh do anything that's close without good justification for it yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And that's a, that's a good semi-segue into the Church Fathers, although just before we get into that, there's one other objection I want to look at um, with respect to how the East will uh, make a distinction um, between mediation and intercession, because, of course, there's the First Timothy 2.5 passage brought up, um, but then they'll claim, um, well, we're not claiming our saints to be or angels to be our mediators in the sense that Christ is, but they're just inter interceding on our behalf as a distinction. And so that kind of that goes into Chris's question here, which uh, I guess we'll deal with it now since we're since I wanted to bring up this objection anyway. So he basically gives what about the response that we're asked that we can ask our friends and family to pray for us. Uh, and for him, that's because the quoting that passage uh, isn't a serious objection because everyone agrees that Christ is the only atoning mediator and intercessor. So, so how would you respond to this distinction? Yeah, so I go to <clears throat> I go to this in the book, um, and this is page one fifteen is where it starts. Um, so I go through a lexical analysis of the terms for uh, interceding and for mediating, and I also mm -hmm. touch on um, uh, advocate and uh, the in the study I go through. I go through a number of examples. My point is ends up pretty much being these terms are used fairly interchangeably in the New Testament uh, and in some of the early fathers. I also go into the Old Testament uh, and look at like Yakah. I, I have horrible Hebrew. That's probably not right at all. But that's uh, Strong's H3198 if someone wants to look it up and get the actual word because I can't pronounce it. Um, <laughs> but uh, the argument I make pretty much is that these terms are fairly interchangeable in New Testament and are applied to 
Christ, they're also sometimes applied. Yeah, people are intercessors on behalf of other people. Sure. Um, we don't deny the intercession of saints, though. Uh, we say actually say that the saints do indeed intercede for us, but it doesn't mean we should invoke them. Um, but my argument is, roughly speaking, that these are just, you can't make a distinction between intercession and mediation in the Bible or in the early church fathers, because those terms are used fairly interchangeably throughout both sources. Mm. Uh, so you could, yes, you can make a, you can make a conceptual distinction between the yeah. two, but you can't make it linguistic based on the original texts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want to say that Christ is the only mediator in a unique way and that the saints are intercessors for us in a different way, well, we're fine with that. Um, yeah. yes, the saints are intercessors for us, but that doesn't mean we should invoke them. So, yeah. you know, that, that's pretty much the, the reply I'd give, uh, to that, but if, the section I'm not going to read that section of the book so much out of hand because it's a, a bunch of Greek and Hebrew that I really don't pronounce well, and uh, it's mostly just here are the verses I go you know I go through them and say look how it's used in this verse that verse the other verse they're interchangeable. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, and it's it's it, 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 it it's always baffled me on this topic how when people are specifically um because in, in fairness there are some people who'll be very imprecise and they say oh no we we deny the intercession of the saints whatever which is kind of silly um but when people are even being as precise as you are like specifically praying to them or invoking them or what have you um even then you'll 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 so often get a uh, roman romanist and easternist uh, eastern detractors and that's not all of them of course many of them can understand the distinction but you'll get many detractors who will just say, oh, but the, they they intercede for us. But it's like, it's clearly not the same thing. It's Have you ever noticed like why, have you ever wondered why they so often kind of conflate that? It's it's, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it is kind of strange. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah. That, I, I, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go, go, go. Oh, I was going to say, I, I think the distinction is, um, there. you could make a conceptual distinction, but if you're going to make it on linguistic terms, Strict, strictly speaking from the New testament okay christ and the spirit are called their our intercessors they're also called mediators so yeah. is is there a difference between mediators and intercessors in the New testament the terms are pretty interchangeable so the distinction yeah. doesn't really work strictly on linguistic grounds yeah there's a pretty it's a pretty univocal sense it's just the matter of what kind of intercessory role they're praying that's playing that's kind of the key thing um, yep. But with that said, especially with your mention of Justin Martyr, we can now move on to the Church Fathers. And I was genuinely surprised to see, uh, looking at uh, looking at the book and reading it, how lengthy your section on the Church Fathers is. Because I've always, I, I've never looked deeply into this. It hadn't been in my interest for a while, but I always had the impression, um, just with how confidently Romanists and Easterners will speak of and, and quote left, right, and center church fathers like, oh, look, they believe in praying to saints. Oh, look, they believe in invoking and all that stuff. They'll, they'll bring up irrelevant quotations on the saints interceding for us, but also alleged quotes on like, look, we can pray to them, we can invoke them, so on and so forth. Um, so so I'm genuinely very interested on, um, on your uh, defense of how actually no, uh, at least up to a certain period, um, that the church fathers did not, or at least most of them or a bunch of them did not support uh, this concept of the... Uh, of the of the invocation of saints and angels so uh give us give us some of your earliest examples that you appeal to on this yeah so uh the first example uh well I'll, so throughout the book i give a lot of precise citations to defend the individual points i'm making in my arguments but in my actual section where i say invocation is unsupported by the early fathers starting on page 65 um my first example is irenaeus uh in which invocation of angels is associated with a radical sect um now people usually uh respond to this uh by saying okay it's only in limited context um Irenaeus also says this with respect to uh performing things it seems to be miracles um by invocation of angels and he says we don't do that um that's that's heretical as well um so i fully will admit that um these are more narrower contexts but as far as like early witness like there's no early witness to this practice at the at this time mm -hmm. and so you have to, you know, go, go with the sources and the limited stuff we have. Um, so at the very beginning, Irenaeus, you know, really early church, he gives two examples of this practice or something very similar, at least, and says, we don't do this. It's radical. Uh, so the specifically, this is the Carpocrates. That's an against heresies uh, 1.31.2. And the second one, which is about invoking angels for miracles, is in against heresies 2.32.5. 
Uh, the next example is origin and origin. There are a lot of origin quotes throughout the book. I know origins a, a heretic. He's condemned at the fifth council. Um, he, he's, he's a really church not... father. I'll die on that hill. Regardless of his <laughs> he, just because his, 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 yeah. his influence is monumental. You, yeah. His influence <laughs> is monumental. He's condemned for apocatastasis, which is more about pretty much he Platonized Christianity so that everything returns back into God because this is a doctrine of Neoplatonism. We don't need to go into that. Um, but he's condemned for very unrelated things to this. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh oh. Uh oh. Man's frozen again. Oh no. Hold up. Hold up. Am I back now? Okay, you're back. You 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 I'm froze back. when okay. you said, and so so you're just going to go on. To oh, the... and so many examples throughout the book, um, of origin because he repeatedly says things about how we don't pray to anyone except for God, just straight mm -hmm. up, um, yeah. against Celsus. I, these quotes are huge on the page once again. So I'm not going to read the whole quotes uh, on the stream, but against Celsus, book five in particular, uh, has just tons and tons of quotes about how we only pray to God. Now we don't pray through angels or saints. Uh, it's, it's very explicit and clear, and there's there's tons of them throughout the book because of, there's so many. In fact, Origen's argument is actually, he goes too far uh, because he actually ends up saying, we don't even pray to Christ. He, he he's commits uh, subordinationist mm -hmm. heresy. And actually, yeah. I'm pretty sure he wow. says somewhere in here, and I point this out, that he, um, he actually says that uh, Christ is not the same substance as the Father, which is obviously explicit heresy. Yeah. Um, but I, I've heard. The point, <laughs> oh, sorry, it's irrelevant. Keep going. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we could take him in different contexts and say he doesn't mean the same thing by substance, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that's the point thinking, is yeah. that he doesn't even say we should pray to Christ. He actually denies that. Mm. So if in or and he says all others believe the same thing uh, around him. So regardless of whether origin, you know, whether you like origin or not, he unless you think he's just lying about everyone else around him, which would be a rather <laughs> strange thing to do. Especially because yeah. he's making an argument about what Christians believe against to the to the pagans, it'd be yeah. strange for him to lie and like weaken his argument by saying something false that other Christians don't do. It'd be very weird. So Origen says, "Oh yeah, nobody does this. In fact, I don't even pray to Christ." And so uh, that's obviously a big a big problem because if you don't yeah. pray to Christ, how could you pray to saints or angels? I mean, Hebrews says that Christ is above all of them. So as you a number of passages in the Bible, like, you know, yeah. Christ being above all creation, etc. Um, so yeah, obviously origin, he has a bunch other sections other than against Celsus, his, his treatise on prayer, um, homilies on Joshua commentary on the song of songs. Um, he has a lot of passages about this topic, very explicit. Um, Lactantius is the next example. He just, he has a section it's on the divine institutes. He, uh, talks about, uh, the follies of men, uh, it talks about going to these like demigods, gods, the dead. Um, he puts the category of prayers to the dead in the same category as giving one's soul to demons and calls the practice impious, guilt-worthy, rebellion against God, inexpiable, meaning unforgivable, and a violation of every sacred law. Uh, th those are quotes of the terms he's using to describe this practice. Um, that's prayers to the dead. That's that's not any even particular things about like idolatry or something. That's just prayers to the dead. He was always describing. Um, Synod of Laodicea. That's two passages in there. If I mean, Ooh, you can buy them, but Ooh. these are on these are on uh, <laughs> these are all for the most part. These are public domain. A couple of them aren't like the the homilies on Joshua from Origin and commentary and Song of Songs. Uh, you have to you'd have to buy those. Um, you know, and the Fathers of the Church, a new translation, or, you know, those series. But most of these are on the, are in the shaft set um, or are in other public domain translations. <clears throat> uh, Synod of Laodicea, common one to pe that people go to um, in these debates. Uh, it's been cited since the Reformation era. But the Synod of Laodicea explicitly condemns invocation of angels. Uh, quote, mm -hmm. Christians must not forsake the Church of God and go away and invoke angels and gather assemblies, which things are forbidden, etc. Uh, calls it idolatry. Uh, obviously, yes, this could be a more narrow context um, that it's only talking about angels. There are some arguments that they're actually talking about naming angels, uh, invoking. Oh, it, in at least people probably know this in other languages, like in Spanish, when you say "me llamo Seth," it means it means I call myself Seth. Well, "llamo" call call is like you being used for what's my name. Invoking is similar in Latin. Um, so you could, if you wanted to say, I'm naming something or calling it, okay, you call it this. Does that mean you're speaking to it or you're naming it? Well, it could be, could be either. 
So some people argue that this is just talking about naming angels, meaning like they're naming angels that they don't actually know the names of. So they're coming up with like new angels. Um, so that's like our response people typically give. Um, however, uh, Schaff makes actually a good note on this and says, Theodoret makes mention of the superstitious cult in his exposition of the text of St. Paul in Colossians 2, 18. And when writing of its con condemnation by the synod, he says, quote, they were leading to worship angels such as were defending the law. For they, or for, said they, the law was given through angels. And then he says this lasted for a long time. Um, and he says, even to this day, an oratory of St. Michael can be seen among them and their neighbors, which is rather interesting because St. Michael is an angel that's named in scripture, obviously. Mm, yeah. So if you want to argue that it's about naming new fake angels, uh, you'd have to say that Theodorate just got this wrong or that they named fake angels and had an oratory of St. Michael. But the question is, what's the problem of having the oratory of St. Michael? Um, unless they're just saying, oh, okay, it was an idolatrous oratory of St. Michael. Mm. And rather than a non-idolatrous one, uh, I suppose. But he doesn't seem to you know, make these tight distinctions there at all. The author also comments again on it in Colossians, in the commentary on Colossians 3.17, so a different spot. Uh, this is a fresh translation, by the way. But if you want it, it's uh, in the Minier set, uh, Greek, volume 82, uh, column 620. Offer thanksgiving to God and the Father through him, that's Christ, not through angels. The Laodicean Synod, following this law, and desiring to find a cure for that old disease, enacted a law that they should not pray to angels, nor forsake our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's pretty darn clear about praying to angels. And the pray there is not invoke. Uh, pray there is uh, the, the Greek um, uh, prosukomai, is it? Yeah, um, my Greek's bad. But yeah, that, it's uh, not invoke in that in that spot at the end. So, I mean, this is pretty darn clear. Don't pray to angels in Theodoret. Mm -hmm. A challenger uh, approaches. Why well, know Theodoret is someone, again, someone controversial figure. <laughs> someone claims that he does actually support the invocation of saints in other places, in other unnamed, unsighted places. Do you happen to know any such proof texts or not? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, no. Fair enough. Uh, wait, are, well, actually, let me, let me just double check my section because I feel like I would have touched on that mm. I, yeah. i've already forget, forgotten uh what are my early sources that i went through uh, let's see yeah mm. it's possible That's... that you could you could, sometimes there are conflicting um pieces of evidence i don't mm -hmm. cover that in this book yeah. um but uh, one of the difficulties there is that you have to parse through like which texts are legitimate and which aren't um yeah. i don't to my knowledge neither of these two uh spots in theater are controversial but uh, yeah. I haven't looked at all the scholarly literature on that. No, that's, that's very I don't fair. know of any and, evidence uh, that they're not legitimate, though. Yeah, and uh, unfor unfortunately, it could have been a good discussion, but unfortunately, Cy didn't exactly give some citations. So to kind of give the, what's his name, Christopher Hitchens' little dictum, that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So that's a point for us still. <laughs> so um, I'm actually pretty interested. I reckon if that's cool with you, I'd like to skip to Augustine because he's one sure. um, whose <clears throat> proof texts I hear a lot um, alleged in support of prayer to an invocation of saints and angels. How would you, so how do you deal with Augustine? Okay. So Augustine's an interesting figure. I fully admit in the book that he has examples of, um, of invocation. Now the examples of invocation in Augustine are, uh, in his sermons. His sermons are probably the hardest things to attribute to him. That's not to say they're not legitimate. I don't personally know of any scholarship that says those sermons are illegitimate. Mm -hmm. But in general, there is some doubt about Augustine's sermons. Um, there is a section of his sermons that we pretty much everyone acknowledges to be um, not legitimate. They were written by, written by later monks and attributed to him, to him, or at least like given his name in, in like honor of him or something like that. If you don't want to say they were like lying or trying to falsify documents, you can go that route. Um, but in general, even with his other sermons, there is at least some doubt about some of the sermons because they're difficult to say, is this a for sure part of him or not, or part of his original works mm -hmm. or not. Um, so there is that as a, a preface. I don't actually touch this much in the book because some of this I discovered later after the book had already been published and printed. Right. Um, but I do go through in the book some examples where Augustine at least limits the practice. Um, so specifically uh, in City of God, uh, book eight, uh, he critiques the pagans for going through demons or angels to get to their gods. 
and says, instead, we should resemble the goodwill of the angels to get to God. Um, so he says, instead of, you know, praying to an angel to reach, you know, as an intercessor to reach God, you should instead pretty much be righteous, uh, just like the angels are. And that's your better way to reaching God. Uh, that's in City of God 825. Wherefore, by we must by no means seek through the supposed mediation of demons. Demons here is just, or demons is not meaning demons in this context. Demons is being used for a general word for uh, angels, spirits, um, daimons, okay. if you want to use the more, you know, the Greek way. Mm -hmm. uh, this is common. Obviously, Socrates had a demon, right? But it's not a demon. Yeah. It's just someone who helped him, supposedly. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so now, you know, suppose a mediation of demons to avail ourselves of the benevolence or beneficence of the gods, or rather of the good angels. So, well, actually, oh, so never mind. I was wrong about that. I was, I'm misquoting mm -hmm. in my head. Flip, things are flipped around. But don't go through the demons. Right. Also, don't go through the good angels. <laughs> but through resembling them in possession of a good will through which we are with them and live with them and worship with them the same God, although we cannot see them with the flesh of our eyes, or sorry, the eyes of our flesh. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, don't go through the angels <laughs> or demons, but instead go through, uh, mm -hmm. just go, go to God, but with good will, uh, you know, be righteous. And the same book, mm -hmm. uh, so this is later in uh, City of God, book eight. This is in paragraph mm -hmm. 25. Uh, he says that when we make offerings, uh, to saints at uh, their reliquaries. Uh, he said that those are not done by the better Christians. Uh, so in other words, he's saying oh. this practice is a heterodox or maybe illicit, something along those lines. He said the better Christians don't offer things at the reliquaries of saints. Reliquaries, That's sorry. That's um, very so interesting. Now, those, those passages, super sorry, of, of Augustine describing how People go to saints' relics and they get miracles and all that jazz. That that that's the one I hear quite a bit. But then suddenly to hear him say, "Oh, by the way, the better Christians don't do that." <laughs> that's that's yep. interesting. He says, "But whoever heard a priest of the faithful?" So he's saying, "Who has ever heard of this standing at an altar built for the honor of worship of God over the holy body of some martyr? Stay in the prayers. I offer you a sacrifice, o, o Peter, or O Paul, or O Cyprian, for it is to God that sacrifices are offered at their tombs. The God is." Uh, the God who made them both men and martyrs and associated them with the holy angels in celestial honor. And the reason why we pray such honors or sorry, pay such honors to their memory is that by doing so, we may give thanks to the true God for their victories and by recalling them afresh to remembrance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then he says, let me give the actual quote. And even such as bring their food. Uh, so I skipped down a little bit. So some people are bringing them food. Um, which indeed is not done by the better Christians and in most places of the world is not done at all. Do so in order that uh, th this is do so. He's going back uh, to these Christians bringing food. He's saying, so that was a parenthetical statement. They do this in order that it may be sanctified to them through the merits of the martyrs in the name of the Lord of the martyrs. That is for pre or first presenting the food and offering prayer and thereafter taking it away to be eaten or to be in part bestowed upon the needy. So people are offering the food and then they take it to the needy. But he's saying the good Christians don't do this. And he says, who has ever heard of a priest doing this? <laughs> um, he's, and then he says, in most places, people don't do this at all. So it's it seems to be local, a local issue. And he's saying uh, <clears throat> some people do this, but you shouldn't really. And in fact, none of the priests do. So another one. Uh, he has another quote, and I won't go through all of them, but then another quote in book 22 of City of God, uh, where he says that, at the altars uh, that are dedicated to God rather than the martyrs, he says. So he says, don't, there aren't altars dedicated to martyrs. The altars are dedicated to God. And he says that the saints are not invoked at the altar in the Eucharistic ceremony specifically, uh, but are, instead God is invoked. So his, this is limited though, I will say. So uh, Augustine is saying in the Eucharistic liturgy, uh, there are not prayers being offered to saints, uh, is his point. So I... Uh, you know, so if this is happening at at his time, uh, these invocations of saints, the invocation of saints is being offered not in the public mass, but I, mean, I guess you could maybe it's being offered at Vespers or something or in private practice, things like that, but not in the Eucharistic prayers. Uh, this doesn't happen. Yeah. So okay. uh, those are a few limiting quotes. There's also a quote which is not in the book, but if you'd like me to pull it up and one sure. of his sermons, which I know I just said the sermons aren't always. If you want to share the screen, I can give permission. Uh, I don't know. Let me grab it real quick. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, no. It pulled up. I have to find it. I, I didn't, I didn't think of preparing this part, um, because it's not in the book, 
But there is a quote from Augustine um, that is, yes, I, this is in Sermon 198 of one of his sets. And if you Google the exact, I'm going to quote it to you verbatim, so you can Google it and go find it uh, where it is. It's in volume two or in page 217 of one of the volumes. And I apologize, I only have a screenshot. So I forget which book this is from. I'm pulling this out of like a, a group chat that I had with friends. Um, but this is Augustine, quote, if anybody says to you, invoke the angel Gabriel in this way, invoke, uh, invoke Michael in that way, offer the former this little ritual, the latter this other. Don't be taken in. Don't consent. And don't let him mislead you just because the names of the angels can be read in the scriptures. Observe rather in what role they are to be read there. Or sorry, observe rather in what role they are to be read there whether they ever de uh, demanded from men any kind of personal religious veneration for themselves and did not rather always wish glory to be given to the one God whom they obey. Uh, so, uh, you know, they pretty much, you know, we shouldn't uh, be invoking them and we shouldn't be venerating them, at least not in a more extreme way. Uh, rather, all glory should be given to God. It's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. And I think one thing there's, there's a, it, one thing that can help this these discussions a bit because Augustine's probably a decent example where you can find texts that seem to say don't do this but then you can find others that say do do this and I think probably one of the best ways to do it is rather than just going along the hyper harmonization there's legitimate like harmonization is legitimate there is legitimate bounds for that um but I think we can all agree especially because again in the end Augustine isn't a prophet um we can agree that uh, people may not always be consistent with their own arguments, especially Augustine, where he's because of his corpus, we know his thought on things has evolved over time. Um, and so yeah. with him or any other father, we shouldn't, um, if, if, we, if one of us was to raise one of these passages, oh, he says, don't do this, but then EO or Romanus says, oh, but he says, do it here. So you must read it through that lens. We should be able to point that as a bit of a, a bit of a question begging exercise um, and be able to, actually look at both texts and actually question whether they are consistent with each other uh, or not. Because in the end, we do that willingly with one another online, critiquing other people in books after the patristic age. And we're more than willing to say, hey, this guy says this thing here, but he's inconsistent with himself over here. Um, we should be more than willing and able to do that with the church fathers as well. So that's kind of something I raise as like a key consideration for anyone who who for, for this topic and any other topic really respecting the opinions of the fathers when someone points out a text and they they accurately exposit it and uh, logically deduce from it or in, in, infer from it that hey they're against this thing or for this thing um that someone who then brings up a counter text that's not necessarily going to get rid of what they say in the first one if that makes sense so i think that's a very yeah. important people for and thing I, I for think people who know in this I think Augustine is just somewhat inconsistent on, on mm. this issue, really, because um, there's also a passage in City of God, or sorry, no, on Care for the Dead, not in City of God. And I quote this in my book, but this is on Care for the Dead, and I believe it's it's somewhere in paragraph 16 to 18. Uh, I forget which page it is on the book, but it's in there. Um, and he talks about uh, can the dead hear us, and he's he's expositing the passage on um, on uh, the the righteous man or the, sorry, the rich man and Lazarus. And you know, that, that passage that's always debated about whether it's a proverb or not proper, a, a, a parable or not. And nobody mm -hmm. can agree. Uh, but regardless of what you take of a it's par parable or not, uh, you know, the rich man, Lazarus and the rich man's down and is being tormented. And Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham is what the passage says. Yes. And uh, Augustine's going through the passage and see, and he's talking about, uh, okay, uh, can the dead communicate or can the living communicate with the dead? Is there communication between worlds? And Augustine just says no. Um, which is rather interesting because obviously if you want to invoke saints, then there has to be some way to communicate yeah. between them. If you want Augustine them to just says you rough. can't. Um, and that's one of my arguments is you just can't. Uh, you, you can't do it because they can't hear us. Uh, and Tertullian says that, Lactantius says it, and so does Augustine. Mm. Um, so uh, three, three church fathers right there uh, that all just say no. You're separated uh, from them. You can't communicate with them. They go through Bible passages on that too, of course. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Pog says he just wants to say you're a handsome man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to completely, uh, completely relevant. But also, I think the entire stream just been debunked. Hail Mary, full of grace. I think we should pack up, Seth. What do you think? 
Oh boy. Yeah, we, we, we should pack up. You know, the we we've we've been debunked about a thousand times in chat now by so true. by standard standard responses. So true, so true. The standard <laughs> we just can't we just can't keep up with the standard responses. We're just coping this entire way. Yep. And yep. Sarcasm. Because you know, case you know we're we're going into every single citation here on the stream. All all you know, hundred sixty pages of uh of citations. I'm quoting every single one verbatim for you. That's it. That's the way. All 250 verses. <laughs> That's it. So true. So true. Um, now, let's look at some uh, issues with potential early witnesses, because you have a section on that sure. as well. Um, I guess uh, we don't have to go through all of them, obviously, because like in the end, you still want people to buy a book and not just make it redundant and let's make it a mega stream anyway. But I reckon, I reckon we start with the martyrdom of Paul um, as sure. a potential early witness. Yeah, let me go to that section. Uh, early witnesses. Oh, what page is that even on? <laughs> it says. I, I should really just look at the. Uh, I should really just look at the table of contents, shouldn't I? Here we go. <laughs> Martyrdom of Paul. So this is the, this is the earliest one, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, Martyrdom when of Paul. This, actually, so oh, there's some debate over this. Um, I think the martyrdom of Paul is is uh, very early. So the Acts of Paul are a set of writings between 95 and 206. Um. So the reason that is is because Thecla dies in the murder, in the in the Acts of Paul, and Thecla dies in ninety five. Okay. So that's the earliest it could be, and then Tertullian cites these, and uh, it's in De Baptismo, which is one of his later works. So two oh six. So that's like your range. Um, but there's uh, there are some reasons to think it's actually uh, fairly uh, even earlier than that, or not earlier than. 95 but on the earlier end of that i won't go into all of those but um uh you know there's one by peter w dunn d-u-n-n -N. uh he did he's a layman but he did a, a rather interesting article on um uh acts of paul and pauline legacy uh, i think that's the title of the article and he goes through a rather lengthy discussion of the language used in the book and he concludes that it's early uh, second century okay uh anyhow so that that's your dating uh if you want the rundown on some of the scholarship uh so it's a uh, it is rather early this is not a like super authoritative work necessarily eusebius places it alongside rejected writings mm -hmm. um but it's that also includes the didache and possibly the book of revelations so you know take that with a grain of salt from eusebius and when he when he's saying that uh the point is that it's not part of scripture um even though it's early and the other point is that this isn't like a work that's typically used as authoritative in the church but it's it's an early source nonetheless. Uh, the quote that's relevant is from the Martyrdom of Paul section, which is, it has multiple sections this work does. Uh, the Martyrdom of Paul, in which Paul, quote, communed with the fathers. Uh, and there's an ellipsis between communed and with the fathers. And it says specifically that um, he communed with them in prayer in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, Hebrew is probably um, a... a What's the word? An idiom for Aramaic here, actually. Um, probably not actually Hebrew, but that was, that was common at the time to use that word. Yep. So the point is, he's he's talking with them uh, in Aramaic, and then uh, he gets his head chopped off. Uh, so that's how Paul gets yep. murdered. Um, so the difficulty here is that he communes with the fathers, which might mean like the patriarchs, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, it's not really clear what that means. Um, the difficulty here is, okay, what does that mean? What does communing with the fathers mean in the Hebrew tongue? Is this a like trance? Is this a vision? Um, or perhaps it is just simply invocation. But there seems to be some connection with Paul and the recipient. And commune at least suggests the, you know, ekononison, uh, if my Greek is even close. Um, it's close. It seems to me to suggest a, a two-way thing. If I say I'm in communion with you, that obviously does not mean I can only commune at your church and not you at mine. It means there's a there's a two-way connection here. And when we have the communion of saints, it's obviously a connection in both directions always. So this seems to me to be a two-way thing, a conversation. And it's also interesting that it's Aramaic specifically. Um, in other words, that there seems to be some sort of preferred language here. You you could argue, I suppose, that Paul just speak Ara speaks Aramaic, and so that's the language he's comfortable talking to right before dying or something like that. Um I don't think that works personally because I actually think Paul spoke Greek probably as a standard language. 
um, because it was the common tongue of the day. All of his works are written in Greek. And uh, if you actually, actually, I think you had him on your, yeah, you had him on your channel, Michael Potamopatos. Oh yeah, uh, a whole thing on uh, on was Greek the language was that the language of the day mm. for the Jews? And he argues, oh, yeah. I think, convincingly he, he that it was. Me on that. <laughs> so uh, it's unclear why Aramaic would specifically be needed, or if you want to read it literally as Hebrew, uh, why Hebrew would specifically be needed. Right. Um, but my point is that it's a rather it's not a text that's typically considered authoritative, and it's also very unclear what it means. Uh, what does communing mean? Why is it in Hebrew? It's also Paul. Uh, Paul went up to the third heaven. Um, you know, Paul is, seems to have, you know, some Merkaba uh, tradition. That's a Jewish mystic tradition. Mm -hmm. He seems to have a little bit of influence from that in his writings. So is Paul having a vision, something like this? It's really not that clear in the text, but this is one text that people might go to sometimes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So a bit of a definitely needs to get a little bit into the, the language on these issues and get a bit, uh, get a bit finicky and, this topic and many others when we're dealing with uh, these concepts of different actions, but also ideas behind them, definitions can get so like definitions of words can get so finicky at this point. It, it can be a, almost to a ridiculous point. So uh, yeah. that's just something anyone wading into these topics, be prepared to be extremely precise in <laughs> your definitions. It's it, your life depends on it. Um, I'm also interested um, in the uh, in the memoria apostolaro uh, ad uh, atad catacumbas. Memoria apostolorum atad catacumbas. Yeah, close. So enough. the you know the the this is the memoriam for the apostles at the catacombs. Mm -hmm. uh, to give a fairly uh, literal translation mm -hmm. of the using cognates. Um, so this is graffiti in a cemetery under the church of Saint Sebastiano on the third milestone on the Via Appia in Rome. So if you want a location, you can go there. Yep. Uh, the graffiti dates between 244 and 356, according to standard scholarship. Um, so it includes phrases such as, O oh, Peter and Paul, keep in your mind, or keep in your mind in your prayers. O oh, Peter and Paul, intercede for Leontius. O oh, Peter and Paul, intercede for us all, etc. So this is this is an example. Uh, this is This is invocation. Um, and this is 244 to 356. Uh, they also include more ex direct requests such as, O Peter and Paul, save indistinguishable graffiti. O save, O Peter and Paul, again, indistinguishable graffiti. And Martyrius, and save in the Lord, indistinguishable graffiti, etc. So things like this. Uh, the abundance in prayers uh, would make it clear that the spots of the devotion of the two apostles, of course, and many visitors came to ask for intercessions clearly. Um, so in pretty much I, my response to this is simply it's late. Uh, so I, I think this is the actually the example of, OK, the cutoff for when we're saying it's possible that no one was invoking saints before a certain date. I say 356 is the latest. You can say this didn't exist. Uh, this particular memoria uh, apostolorum 244 to 356. This is clear examples, but it's 244 to 356 is pretty much my response. And the examples I give earlier in the book of people denying it, especially how strongly and widely the stuff about origin says, and a few other people in my book, this is the development. I guess my one response I would say, as far as the authority of this is that it's, it's graffiti in catacombs, um, which doesn't like that's so pretty much this, this is pot in popular piety of the people at the time. But the question is, are priests doing this? Is this a public practice, et cetera? Yeah. Um, but this this particular thing is that it's is that this is the pretty much the earliest you can say for sure uh, that we have this practice. There's no there's no evidence that is guaranteed to be before 356 that has invocation. This is the as we'd say the uh, uh, terminus antiquem. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So we can kind of get a an earliest kind of date, and it's. Uh, interesting the the whole dynamic of popular piety because I do see a lot of inconsistent inconsistency in Roman and Eastern apologetics sometimes with um, with Protestant guys as well although I don't see them appealing as much to popular piety anyway um, but on one hand you'll sometimes get them saying oh look see there's this popular look the, this there's this catacomb or inscription or what have you that shows hey look this is clearly popular piety 
um, to which you can simply say, yeah, a lot of things were popular in many different places back then. Like, do, 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 you, really, do you really want to go there? Are we going to, um, what should we become? Uh, what, what was that? I mean, there was a billion different heretical groups back then, but the one I'm thinking of the, uh, the guys who literally worship Mary and bake cakes for, I forgot what it was called, but the ones mentioned in Epiphany. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can find, yeah. you, I, I remember even looking at, um archaeological because i've got a really good book on uh, early christianity respecting archaeology and it has a lot of detail on the archaeology of city of, of the city of rome and you can notice you can find things from multiple different sects including valentinians um and so that it, with respect to if it was if the question was merely what was present in a certain time sure yeah but finding a catacomb inscription or what have you tells you almost nothing on like the scope of that, let alone the orthodoxy and whether this comes from the apostolic deposit itself. That's a way different question there. Um, right. Yes, right. Truth Defenders, that's the, the Corolidians. Thank you, Truth Defenders. That's that's the one I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, yeah, so even these inscriptions, like if, if they were to get like a huge mass of them across places and time periods, there'd be a bit more significance. But uh, this, this is just like one thing, you know. Yep. And you mind if I go through just the next example too, because this is the real, yeah, sure. this is the most common one brought up in like every single like Catholic apologetics, Eastern Orthodox apologetics site ever is the sub to um presidium, which is oh, the, uh, yeah. the, the, this is a prayer to Mary. This is the one that everyone always brings up. Um, and I'll just read the section. So well, I'll read the quote for you first. Here, here's the text. Mother of God, hear my supplications, suffer us not to be in adversity, but deliver us from danger. Thou alone, etc. So obviously th this is invocation of Mary. Uh, it's pretty clear that it is. So the typical thing you'll see on sites is that this is dated to 250. And this is a common problem with these citations. And this happens in the previous one for Memoria Apostolorum. This happens, happens in the Pectorius Auton, or also known as the Auton inscription. Uh, this happens in, um, let me see if I have other examples of this. This happens in a work by Methodius. Well, it's actually by Pseudo-Methodius. Scholars, pretty much no scholars think it's by Methodius anymore. But all almost all the early examples you have to be careful about the dates and actually read the scholarship on them which isn't always in english uh so have fun uh digging through those comparing auto translators of languages you don't speak etc or finding people that do speak um, whatever language the things are in so i dug through a lot of like german scholarship for some of these because mm. uh that's what the scholarship's in on the topic so mm. rylan's papyrus the sub and presidium so this is the most common one. So I say, quote, while many popular sites provide an absolute terminus postquem of 250, so it's th they're they're provo providing that as the uh, as the uh, earliest date for this. They're saying, oh, it's 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 the earliest date is 250, but then they just say it's from 250. Mm. So that's so that's what they say. Careful the distinction. Not an actual date, but the earliest possible. Yeah. Yep. So the, well, that's what they're saying. So they're saying that's the date. Some sites are a little more careful and they say that's the earliest date. So it's mm. sites, you know, there's a difference there, but it's it's kind of a moot point to a degree. I continue. More recent scholarship has disputed this greatly, with some scholars giving it a terminus postquem in the fourth century, broadly speaking, so the 300s. Uh, this would be an example of that would be T.H. Keller. Uh, and this is a French work, uh, Maternité Spirituelle, Maternité Mystique. I don't speak mm. French. Um, so you, you want to go look up that work. Uh, so he's saying it's just, it's not from 250. The earliest possible date is in somewhere in the fourth century, he says. Or another scholar, the late fourth century, as seen in the official publisher of the papyrus. So if you go to oh, wow. Robert uh, Robert's CH, Catalog of the Greek and Latin Papyri in, in the John Rylands Library, Manchester, Manchester Volume 3, and actually go and check it out. This is on page 41, number 470, hence P470. Um, he just dates it to the, the earliest it could possibly be is late fourth century, according to the actual publisher of the virus. So all these Catholic sites and Orthodox sites are saying this is from 250. Well, the official publisher says the earliest it could be is late fourth century. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we have, we have two scholars, one scholar, one important scholar saying fourth century broadly, that's in a theological encyclopedia that, that French work I cited first time. Um, the second one is the official publisher says late fourth century, the terminus, the terminus antiquem. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the latest possible date it could be. 
the terminus antiquem has been said to be 6th century, 7th century, or even later, depending on the scholar. Uh, you can look up De Bruyne Theodore uh, appeals to the intercession of Mary in Greek liturgical and liturgical texts from Egypt. That's a 2015 work. Uh, that's an academic journal. So the point is, okay, this pretty much, so the earliest it possibly could be is supposedly 250, <clears throat> but pretty much that's not actually good. What's more likely is it's the earliest it could possibly be is probably late uh, 300s. And the latest it could possibly be is uh, maybe 8th century. Uh, so this is a huge range and not when people say it is. So, and this is typical for pretty much all of these works. Um, the So usually they say the earliest possible date and they really push that early. But if you actually go and read read the academic literature on the citations that these sites get that people are using for their quotes and actually find the dates that are done by scholars. And they're almost always way later uh, for the most likely dates. So yeah. that's the, one of the main arguments throughout almost all the sources. Yeah. That is, that is, yes, that is quite fascinating. And I, again, I think it only points to, cause I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it's not a very big papyri. Um, it's, no, I mean, it's, it's tiny. <laughs> yeah. It's very tiny. It's just a short prayer and all that. And so, uh, given those massive date ranges, there's a fair bit of speculation going on with dating, but even beyond that, the issue of, um, uh, well, apart from the immediate provenance of where the manuscript itself was sourced is like, is it an original? Is it a copy of something earlier? How widespread was this prayer actually? And so all you get, all that that manuscript proves is that uh, at least one person somewhere invoked Mary. And we have, as, as far as I've known, because I've read a little bit about this, and as far as uh, as far as we know, we don't know who this person was, whether this no, was we a don't person know. In, in good standing with the with the apostolic church or if it was a, a, Col a Coloridian or proto-Coloridian or whatever. We have no idea. And so that quite literally, kind of like the catacombs, it proves nothing pretty much because there was all sorts of ideas out there. Yeah, it, it proves that this, this this existed. But I mean, the examples that are against it also say they existed and they're writing against it. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, yeah. if you want to see, prove it's early, I mean, sure, the, the Senate of Laodicea says it, says it happened. It says it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so you have to be careful about how you, how you use, you know, these sources. I mean, sure, there's nothing in the source that indicates that specifically there's that this is heretical in some way it's not like someone's writing don't do this and then saying quote uh there'd be yeah. some prayer sure there's not that but uh using it as a proof text for your doctrine uh is rather difficult mm, exactly it's almost it's almost as if someone someone mentions someone actually worships angels and they're like hey guys look in a paul's letter to the colossians he mentions the worship of angels it existed in the apostolic age bro it's so it's so, we got it boys. Yeah. <laughs> and he says not to do it but he said it existed <laughs> oh man more basically that basically that um now one i do find interesting would also be i think so because you've got these examples like catacomb inscriptions you got mm -hmm. random papyri from here and there um and as we noted that's pretty much a nothing burger doesn't really prove anything on their own um but i guess a more significant uh potential witness would be early liturgies so could you cover that yeah sure so um Many complete texts of early liturgies we have include invocation. Uh, so what I'm saying, you have to be careful what I'm saying with that, though. Um, when I'm saying we have complete texts of early liturgies, I'm saying that we have liturgies from, we have full manuscripts from a certain period of liturgies that are old. And these liturgies contain invocation. Right. However, it's important to note liturgical development is like an obvious thing that everyone agrees occurs. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody denies that liturgical development occurs. I mean, read through the early sources in the church. It's very clear there's liturgical development. Uh, you know, even individual rites get developed a lot. They get embellished, they get reduced, they get reformed. This is the Ambrosian reforms, the Gregorian reforms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, at least the West, those are the Western ones. And the East has tons of liturgical reforms too. Probably a lot more because they're way more complicated liturgies, honestly. Um, I don't, I'm not like a liturgical history expert. I know some, mm -hmm. of course, sure. but um, the this is sometimes used as an argument to say, look, uh, the some liturgy has invocation of saints. This liturgy goes back to Chrysostom. Therefore, invocation invoking saints goes back to Chrysostom, and Chrysostom's a saint. Everyone loves Chrysostom, so you know, seems like it's supported there, right? 
The difficulty is the liturgy or the manuscripts we have that support uh, invocation in these liturgies are from much, much later than the liturgies actually are from. And we have smaller fragments of, litur of liturgies from earlier periods, and they don't have these. Now, not necessarily from the same sections, though. That's the difficult part. It's not like we have a section of a liturgy from an early period and then like in a manuscript and then a later manuscript has it and it's embellished with invocation. We don't have that. Right. We have other sections of the liturgy, but they're from earlier periods and they don't have invocation of them, but they also don't have invocation in the later manuscripts. So the sections that we have from early are from sections of the liturgy that don't have invocation. So sure, you could you could appeal and say, oh, but we have manuscripts of the liturgy going really early. Okay, sure we do, but not from the sections that have any invocation in them. So it's not really relevant how like the question of what's the earliest manuscripts we have of a liturgy are not really relevant. The relevant question is what is the earliest what are the earliest manuscripts we have of these liturgies that have the sections that have invocation? And the answer is quite late actually. Um we're talking 7th or 8th century for these types of things. Uh so I'll I'll quote from the book the Liturgy of St. James, uh, which is a famous liturgy, is one of the earliest liturgies. Um, in fact, it's the earliest liturgy that we have kept in full to this day, um, at least with its developments. Uh, the Liturgy of St. James, earliest manuscript, is in a 9th century codex. That is Vaticanus Graecus 2282. The Liturgy of St. Basil, which comes from the mid-4th century, has earliest manuscripts from the 7th and 8th century. The earliest liturgical manuscripts, that is, those of the Liturgy of St. Mark or St. Kirill, um, which is mid late fourth century, date to the fourth or fifth century for some sections, the sixth century for other manuscripts, and the other and other first millennium centuries after that. But for even for this one liturgy that we have really early manuscripts, even in the modern form, it doesn't have invocation of saints in it. Um, like it, 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 remember the liturgy, remember the liturgy is the uh, the uh, the ordinaries, not the propers. So it's not like we have a full like you know liturgical book that has all of the proper for the whole year. We're talking about the ordinary for the, the the parts that are said every single Sunday. Yep. So even though you could say, oh, this liturgy or that liturgy has invocation of it today, it goes back really early. You have to prove that that's not an innovation that was added into later ver versions of the liturgy. And we simply don't have manuscript evidence for liturgies that are that early. So mm. yes, you could make the appeal um, that they go that early, but you're going to have to prove that's not a development, which requires yeah. just going back into the same text that I go through in the book and other scholars go through to demonstrate mm -hmm. when did this practice come about in the actual evidence we know from the period. And then you can say, okay, was that something added later to the liturgies or was it there at the beginning? It just pushes the question yeah. back pretty much. Yeah, that's right. That makes sense. Um, and so do, I'm curious on, um, I don't know how deeply, if you haven't looked at it, then it's all good, but I'm curious if you have looked at um, with respect to manuscripts of liturgies where we do have, manuscripts of certain sections very early on. Um, and then we have manuscripts, some of those later on manuscripts that are more full um, of the same sections are tested in both. Do you know of like, there is development, uh, even if it's not on this issue, but like oh, yeah. there is development. Yeah, oh, okay. development. Oh, there's development yeah. of liturgies in the same sections, even sometimes it's very slight wording changes. That's often what it is. Um, you know, tiny little things. Um, and it's often just for language change and things like that, especially in yeah. Latin. Um, and reforms too. I mean, like there's, it's not like, so like the, the Western right, uh, I mean, it largely goes back to Gregory as it's in form now, but it's been reformed. It was reformed throughout time. It was reformed in the medieval period, of course, after Gregory and Gregory was reforming something that came before him, but it's not a wholly new right. And so it's still the Western right. Even before Gregory, it probably would look largely the same, but it has, you know, longer prayers here and there. The canon gets shrunk and expanded. A lot of the early Eucharistic prayers are very long, even in the West, um, and get shrunk down uh, as reforms go because they simply, I don't, don't want to say bloated, but they're just they're just long, and they wanted to shorten them to make them simpler. Um, so yeah, the sections that we do have, even for where we have manuscripts that are earlier, sections get reformed and changed. And that's pretty much my point is liturgies develop. You can't just say this liturgy we have today is called the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, therefore uh, that's what it was at the exact the same way, way back then. And so okay. you have to go in liturgical scholarship. It's largely the same. Sure. But, uh, you have to demonstrate that those particular things are there in the early settings. And I, I would, did not find that to be, uh, convincing. Yeah, that's, that's actually very fair. And when you brought up how 
there is a very early liturgy for which we have the earliest manuscripts of it and it doesn't in the full form have the intercession uh, uh, invocation of saints that's Wow, that's very significant. Okay, I'm going to buy your book even faster now <laughs> before I read through the whole thing on uh, on the digital document. Um, but I, I want to backtrack once just to the previous section on um, positive evidence against it because uh, I'm actually very interested. There's a question uh, in the Q&A that touches on this. So I, and maybe you'll fully answer it now or not. Um, but in any case, I'm very curious about your citation of the 8th to 9th century Franks um, on the lack of support oh, yeah. for... Uh, the invocation of saints please do deal with that because that um because that's like this is the late period where this thing is now like it's in full swing a lot of a lot of things a lot of people doing it so that have to have opposition is significant yep yep let me uh get that second let me, let me get the page number up because i'm not remembering the page number for all these sure. 82 okay um yes eighth, eighth ninth century franks this is rather interesting so the the best source on this is thomas is uh sorry thomas odin um or sorry, not thomas odin that's the previous one thomas fx noble two thomases so the book is images iconoclasm and the carolingians um that's the title so he's focusing on the 8th 9th century franks this is theodolf um wallafried einhard you know very household names um it actually does have alcuin uh, who is if you're gonna know anyone from that period is alcuin um so th th this uh this section is pretty much how is how is the uh, West Church not not the whole Western Church necessarily, but the Frankish area under control of Charlemagne. This is the this is the cultural center of the West at the time because Rome had fallen, um, and so you know Charlemagne raises up this Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so the the Carolingians, how are they responding to Nicaea too? Because uh, Nicaea too, obviously everything about icons and stuff, but it also has stuff about invocation of saints. In, in the actual uh, section as one canon on it. And it also has a section where um, someone who has lapsed proves his orthodoxy by invoking, uh, having a prayer that invokes uh, Mary, I believe it is. And so he's accepted actually back into the, to the council uh, as orthodox because of this invocation. So uh, Nicaea II supports this practice. How are, how are these Frankish theologians responding? And uh, they don't respond well to this. Uh, I should probably point out first that the immediate response that everyone gives is they didn't understand it. They had a bad translation. Uh, you know, they, I'm not going to say, oh, I'm not saying that people are saying, oh, they're just dumb Westerners, but people pretty much say there's too much miscommunication. They didn't understand the debates that were going on, et cetera. Um, my response is uh, actually go and take a look at the, at the original documents, uh, the Caroline book, uh, which the other Paul I know is working on some stuff for. Actually, That's take a right. look at it and actually first pick up ever, Thomas FX. Let's have a full English translation. As far as I'm aware, I've made the full, the first full English translation of the prefaces and the tables of contents. So, made history already. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's pretty clear from these writings that we have that that's not the case. Um, it's like a common character that's made, and it's even in literature. You'll see people say that, um, like in actual you know published books and things like yeah. that. But it's pretty much a claim that doesn't really hold water because we have the writings of these people and yep. discussing the theology of it. And they totally understand the distinctions between the veneration, mm -hmm. the worship. They make even a distinction between commemoration and veneration. Uh, commemoration is pretty much a, a weaker form of veneration um, that they're making. They're saying, oh, no, uh, these people in the East that are supporting Nicaea too, they're saying we don't venerate like they do. Well, oh, my man froze again. Should be oh. a couple of seconds, probably. Is it back? Uh, yep, yeah, you're back. You Fair you enough. left off when you said we don't venerate like they do. Yeah, we don't venerate like they do. Uh, we reject that. Uh, that their distinction is sufficient, yep. and instead we we commemorate the saints though still, but we don't venerate them the same way they do. We have a lesser form that is weaker because we think their positions unorthodox. Yeah, so they clearly yeah, understand that. Being sorry, made. sorry, keep going. Um, so I'll actually get into the quotes though on specifically on invocation, but I like, I like to point that out because it's not that they didn't understand it. In fact, they actually write in the, we actually have writings from them that say, man, the translation we got is awful. How, like, why did the, why did you guys translate the Greek so poorly? So it's not <laughs> like they're just getting like a bad manuscript and don't realize it. They know that what they got was not the best translation. That's interesting. Could you, after the show, would you be able to send me a, a citation 
on that, yeah. like where they wrote that in the Libri calendar. Because that, because sure. this is actually before you get onto the quotes and invocation, just to finish it off. Um, this is a major motivator for me actually picking the Libri Carolini for this little AI translation project, precisely because it is such a huge and pivotal text on this issue, and yet it's pretty much exclusively in the domain of like Latin speaking scholarship at the moment because the vast majority of it just hasn't been translated. And so that's why you can have this extremely common apologetic from orthos um, and Romanists where they'll say, oh, they got a bad translation. They didn't, they conflated veneration and adoration because the whole thing was just translated as adorare or adore. Um, but I, I remember reading a, a little bit on Wikipedia, funnily enough, the one time it is actually helpful um, where I actually mentioned, well, no, that's not true. They do actually recognize the distinction. Like if you look at this specific part, I think it's like one of the chapters in book two, I think. And so that was a partial motivator where I'm like, hey, I'm going to translate this. Um, I've got the table contents done. So that allows me to actually navigate what the chapters are about. And so now I can just tactically translate this one I want to, this one. And so that'll probably be one of my first ones to actually go to that relevant chapter or chapters where they actually recognize. And, I, and, I've, and I've read the subtitles of the table of contents. And I think I know the one they're looking at where they actually do recognize the distinction. So they're not just buffoons with a bad translation. So that whole apologetics just fake. Yeah, and, it, and people have to remember this is Alcuin is in on this, and Alcuin. I mean, this is this is not just a random guy. Alcuin of the Western guys at the time, he is the biggest name. Uh, like, uh, there's like a drop, you know. There's like Gregory the Great, and then there's like a dead period, pretty much. I mean, there's I guess there's Isidore, or Isidore Seville. Then there's a, literally the the so-called Dark Ages, where it actually, if we're gonna call any age the Dark Ages, it is the era between Isidore and the Carolingian. Right. Oh, happened again. Happened again. Give it a couple seconds. I'm back. All right, you're back. You said uh, I don't know dark why. Ages between, it's so weird. Dark Ages between Isidore and yeah, Carolingian. Isidore and the Carolingian Renaissance. If there's any period that's the Dark Ages, it's then. And the the big guy to pop up after that is Alcuin. Alcuin's okay. the biggest guy between like Gregory the Great and like. Anselm maybe in the West. I mean, uh, John Scotus Harry J. Nobody's like a heretic. Uh, <laughs> like Alcuin's not a small guy. He's he's big news, and he's in on this. So he, and he's a saint. So this is not just some random dude. Um, yeah. So anyhow, let's get to some of the quotes uh, so you can get it. So let me give you a a quote from Einhard. Um, Einhard begins with prayer. Or sorry, this is a quote from Noble talking about Einhard. Einhard begins with prayer. He reviews scriptural and conciliar sources to say that as far as he can see, prayer is to be addressed to the Father alone. Moreover, prayers must be in the correct form and must ask for approved things. The things spelled out in the petitions of the Paternoster, or the Our Father. And this is a point that actually Augustine and Cyprian make. I go through this in the book that church, a number of church fathers say we shouldn't exceed the Lord's Prayer. And obviously the Lord's Prayer doesn't have invocation of saints in it. Mm. Um so as far as doctrine of prayer goes, that's a good section of the book. You know, continuing. Does he say exactly what book and chapter in the Caroline books? Uh, in this section, uh, he probably he has citations of the quotes in the in the original book. I don't have these citations oh, within okay, the citation okay. in, yeah, my, okay, in okay. front of me. Uh, <laughs> continuing, he says, addressing the wrong person in the wrong way for the wrong reasons will result in prayers not being answered. Einhard goes on to muse over quote. The apostles, martyrs, and other spirits who are with God. End quote. He says, quote, "I recall hearing it said that there are some people who think that benefit may come from praying to the saints, and that the saints themselves may even be the beneficiaries of prayers." End quote. We know that Einhard was an eager collector of relics, so we ought not to take his musings here as a token of skepticism about the saints and the powers of their intercessions. Einhard is no Claudius, who's a, a Claudius is a later extreme iconoclast. Um, okay. but he may just be telling us something about the apprehensions, the uncertainty uncertainties of an ordinary person in the Carolingian world. How are we supposed to pray and how do the saints figure in this activity? So in other words, he says, yes, the saints intercede for us. He collects relics. He venerates the saints. He thinks this is great, but he says, we don't pray to them. And he says, I recall some that, so he recalls. So he's saying, oh yeah, I've heard of people before out there he hasn't met them he's heard of them who think that benefit may come from praying to the saints this is very uncertain so in other mm. words he doesn't do it and also so he's, he's a huge theologian einhard's one of the big guys uh at the time 
I know he's, he's in he's in Charlemagne's court, so he's a top dog. He doesn't do this. In fact, he doesn't really know anyone he does, but he's heard of people who think it might be beneficial to pray to saints. This is very uncertain language for the 800s or sorry, 700s. Um, if this practice were supposedly widespread and apostolic, did it just go out of vogue or something so that the top theologians of the whole West, well, not the West, of the, of the Frankish Empire don't recognize it? It's rather unusual. So yeah. there's Einhard. That is very, that is very, very unusual. Okay. Um, um, there's, so kind of, do you want more of them or, or no? Oh, sorry, so uh, there's, uh, more, there's more Einhard uh, sections where he talks more about this question of adoration, veneration. He makes it, he makes distinctions there. He explains what he thinks is the correct way to do things, et cetera. So he, he, he clearly makes the distinction. So he's not confusing this to be clear. Einhard specifically yeah. addresses that question. Um, Oh, I won't read the whole quote because it's a little, it's like a good chunk. So next quote, Wallafried, or sorry, Wall, yeah, Wallafried is another one of the guys in the in the court. Wallafried takes a position between that of the East and Einhard, so he's more moderate. He's saying, quote, this is a quote from Noble, Wallafried goes on to say that we do not ask of the saints that they provide salvation, but only that we ask them to intercede for us mm. to God, who alone can save. So there is no, not to be adoration of the images of saints and no inappropriate addresses to the saints themselves. Saintly intercession is valuable and available. Wallafeed's prose is taught, but the context allows us to relax it a bit, uh, et cetera. So in other words, he's saying, okay, yes, you can invoke them to pray to God for you, but you can't ask them for things. And this is actually an important point because if you go back to my section on the Eastern liturgies yeah. uh, and the prayers are praying there, it's not just asking the saints to pray for us. Yeah, it's asking very specific requests God. from them that are much more deep than that. Oh yeah. So he's taking a more moderate position, but the point is he's just saying that's the thing you can do. It's very limiting. Um, and then lastly we have um, Einhard. Wait, did I go for the yes? Okay. So Einhard Wallafried, uh, next Theodolf and Alcuin, uh, demonstrating that Theodolf and Alcuin, who are the two biggest people reject intercession is a little difficult. Uh, you can't really specifically get that from them. They don't, at least in, in, at least in Noble. Um, but uh, it's around, the work is primarily about refuting Nicaea too, which is mostly about images, not about invocation. So this isn't too surprising. However, mm -hmm. when we look at the opus, uh, the opus uh, not only dis disagrees on Nicaea's two position on veneration of icons, but also on the veneration of saints in general. And Noble summarizes the relevant section quote, chapter 16 of the opus, uh, takes up one of the oldest chestnuts in the iconophile repertoire, namely the argument that worship conducted before an image is referred to the person whose image it is. So it's passed on. Theodolf's rhetorical saber was especially sharp this time, quote, do the saints who on their merits were able to rise to the heavenly kingdom and whose images they plan to adore be, or by irresponsible devotion, elicit these superstitious or irrelevant honors? Do they permit themselves to be adored? End quote. Had the saints been keen for honors while they were alive, they would not be in heaven now. They enjoy the Lord's honor. Of what other kind have they need? So uh, so that's, that's more about images and veneration, but the general attitude there seems to be, okay, uh, do the saints, should we re, be giving the saints the honor that Nicaea too is giving them and they answer with a firm no? Uh, which if we take as a proxy for their idea of invocation, would, see, would seem to imply they probably at least take a more moderated position like something we'd see in uh, Wallafried, or they might even take a more extreme position like we see in Einhard. Mm -hmm. So we can't know for sure on Theodolf Malquin. I admit that it's not certain, but uh, the general, uh, you know, the general mindset seems to be against what Nicaea II would do. Okay. Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Um, is there really, do, do you think there's much more essential to cover or do you reckon we've kind of give a, given a good overview of your case here? Um, I, I think we've given a, a decent overview. Um, I, I think actually one more section that might be, I know this is kind of kind of going backwards, but one more section that I think is pretty essential in the beginning of the book is the nature of prayer section. Mm, um, I know we talked yeah. about the prayer as worship and stuff like that. And I go through like examples where they're used for similar things. Um, but I think in the, the section on the fathers, there's a bunch of, I go through a bunch of church fathers in it. And they all seem to be saying that prayer by definition is something you give to God. And at least in, in my book, that seems to be, you know, at least in, in my, my, literally my book, but in my mind, <laughs> um, that seems to be implying that we aren't uh, praying to 
uh, saints or angels, if the very definition of prayer is that it's something that's given to God. Yeah. And there's a lot of, a lot of treatises on prayer in the early church. And none of the big ones from the early guys mention anything about saints. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I'm not going to go through all the quotes, but that was a, I feel like a point that was, um, should be made. And uh, Athanasius in particular uh, on this, which is in actually a chemist's examine, Athanasius argument, I think is particularly strong on this point using this as the argument because Athanasius, when he's arguing about the divinity of Christ and arguing for it, he says that uh, he tries to prove the divinity of Christ to say Christ is consubstantial with the father by saying we pray to Christ. Mm. Is that, that's the foundation of the argument he's making. He says, how do we know that Christ is divine? Well, we pray to him. And so if we're praying to, if, if at the time people were praying to saints, that argument wouldn't have worked because then they would say, okay, we pray to saints too. And so mm. therefore the saints are all consubstantial with the father too. I mean, you could make some argument about participation and all this type of stuff. Sure. Blah, blah. You know, I mean, like, but that's obviously not what he's doing there. His whole point is that if we invoke Christ, he's, he's consubstantial with the father. And therefore we, or we do invoke Christ. Therefore he is. Makes perfect sense. Wow. My dude, this has been pretty darn epic when we'll move on to Q and a after this. Um, but yeah, wow. Epic book, epic, uh, case there. Um, do you have much hope that it'll make at least some waves in these discussions? Uh, I, I hope it will make at least some waves. I don't know if it will convince anyone who's who's committed to the op opposing position. Um, and the reason I say that is because there's always a way to read almost every single text in the way you want it to, to qualify yeah. things, etc. Um, the book is mostly directed at people who are deciding between the two traditions, um, like Lutheranism, or this would apply, this would really apply to Anglicanism too. Um, it, it, the more high church uh, Protestants um, decide between that and Eastern Orthodox um, or even Roman Catholics, even though that's not necessarily who the book is directed at. Um, so it's more aimed at that group or just aimed at people who are Lutheran or Protestant in general. And they're like questioning things and want to read a work on the subject from someone of, you know, a Protestant persuasion. In the words of our favorite Lutheran YouTuber, based. <laughs> and that is indeed a real screenshot that literally just happened. He just replied to someone and said that. So I think history was just made. God willing. Wow. Thank you, Athanasius, for sending that. <laughs> but now, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, you can go to the links below uh, on this video to go and purchase Seth's book. It is really quite excellent. Um, and so you can read his full case that we've just been given a snippet of uh, in this excellent stream right now. So please do go ahead, order it and uh, be edified and be reaffirmed in your true faith. Or if you're someone who's of the opposite position, God willing, uh, at least from our, from our perspective, be more edified by the fullness of the divine testimony uh, on just the, 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 the sheer weight of prayer such that it belongs to nobody but God alone. Um, and so with that said, we will now move on to Q&A. So as usual, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Super Chats and subscribe star supporters will gain priority. And so with that, we will address this question from one of my Patriarch boys, the other Philip. Would it be a sin to use a Ouija board to get clarification of the message from Our Lady of Fatima or Fatima? No, that's that's wholly orthodox. I've used Ouija boards plenty of times, and uh, they always tell me to, you know, go to my uh, priest to do lots of penance, they say to say plenty of Hail Marys, all of the above. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an avid fan of Luigi boards myself. The Mario boards don't really work so well. Oh, tragic. Now, <laughs> next, we have the other Philip again. Uh, question for Seth. If there seems to be a contradiction from the same author, how do you determine which position is more likely to be the lens through which we can best understand the true views of the author? Um, uh, part two, is the impetus placed on explicitness, phraseology, verbiage, uh, comparing number of times either view is expressed? Um. I mean, the second second one kind of answers the first question. Uh, I'd agree. Um, so, I mean, it, where's the emphasis placed or the impetus? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I, I'm, I'm not like a historical, you know, I don't have like historical scholar training necessarily. Uh, sure. I'm, you know, I'm I'm laity. I have a degree in economics. I use software. Um, but, I, you know, I read a lot. That's where this comes from. So uh, that'd be a question probably better for like historical scholars on determining the identical, you know, the, the identity of, you know, the background for everything. Um, but my, I'd say the, the 
as far as like just going to a quote and reading it and trying to figure out, you know, what are the like true and false positions of a person? How do we parse out their inconsistencies? I think we kind of just have to live with the fact that people are inconsistent. Even our most systematic thinkers are not always consistent. Um, like Johann Gerhard, the great Lutheran theologian, who you know is known for being one of the most systematic people and the most like thorough about covering all his, you know, corners and all his blind spots and everything. There are spots in his work that don't seem to agree with each other. Um, and sure. there don't seem to be obvious ways to reconcile them. Mm. Uh, and that's in his like in his systematics. Uh, this is like not like, you know, just random works. We're talking in a, a, a huge set of systematics, but nonetheless, a systematics that's supposed to be consistent with itself. Um, there are spots where it, you'd have to, they're difficult spots where it's hard to reconcile them. Um, so even in the best thinkers, I think we just have to live with, okay, they're mm. not always perfectly consistent within themselves. Sometimes they develop things. Um, but yeah, I do think you're, your general idea was correct. You know, you go, you try to be, try to find the spots that are most explicit, try to find, you know, all the things you can on it and like, you know, add up the numbers, if you will, weigh the sides, be like, okay, if they have five quotes in support, one against, it seems more like their general view is that they support uh, some, mm -hmm. whatever it is you're looking at. So, um, but I just be careful about using them if they're not consistent too. You can't, I don't think you can go to Augustine to say Augustine support invocation of saints. Or go to Augustine and say Augustine didn't support invocation of saints. Yeah, he there the the works don't seem to agree very much, and so we just mm. have to kind of live with that. Yeah, and and I can answer as well because being that textual interpretation is a big big part of what I do. Um, I'd say that if there is a genuine contradiction in an author on some issues, like there seems to be with Augustine on this one, then we can't really say that one or the other would be a true view, so to speak, because we could say like at one point. Uh, it's, enti it's entirely possible that he could have actually changed his opinion on the thing entirely. Um, and so at one point he held this, on the other one he held that. Um, but I guess otherwise there is a sense like, sure, yes, there, there can be a true view because um, because he could actually hold, he could he could actually hold either for or against the invocation of the saints. Um, and so you can see that in some passages, but then it's just that in other places he kind of slips up on that when addressing a different topic. So yeah, and I, I agree with Seth. You kind of uh, answer your own question with talking about explicitness, phraseology, verbiage, number of times expressed. The best criteria is obviously when the person is directly addressing the issue at hand. And so um, if the person, like if, if we're talking about this specific issue, if we have some passages in a person that seem to, by implication, support the invocation of the saints, but then in another passage where he directly addresses the topic, he says no, then we can say that he's inconsistent. He's contradicting himself, but that his true view is against it. Um, so yeah, it, it very much is something to deal with on a case by case basis with various criteria. Um, now we have another one from another legendary patriarch, Athanasius. What about invoking the saints in a way that does not ask them for anything beyond their prayers or asking them in a method indifferent to their response, like asking the angels, rocks, etc., to pray? Uh, so I'll, I'll answer the second one first. Um, if asking them of a different method, indifferent to, or asking them in a method indifferent to their response just means apostrophe. We're totally fine with that. Um, the Anglican hymn, Ye Watchers and Ye Holy Ones, uh, which mm -hmm. is a famous Anglican hymn. It's in Lutheran hymnals, uh, including LCMS hymnals. Uh, so uh, we're totally fine with doing that. It's also in Four Maccabees. There's stuff like that. Um, it's also in some of the Eastern liturgies. So yeah, if it's, we're talking apostrophe, like asking the rocks to pray for you or asking the snow and the dew, as in the Greek Daniel passage, which I didn't read, um, yeah, we're fine with that type of thing. Um, but invoking saints in a way that does not ask them for anything beyond their prayers, I'd say that's a much more reasonable um, practice. However, to my knowledge, the only people who like might do that would maybe like Anglo Catholics. Um, I don't I, I don't quote me on that. But uh, like the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, position, and I assume this is holds the same for the other other Eastern churches. Um, is much more strong than that in their own liturgies, which are the things you have to do. So I, uh, you could, I suppose, take a, a position like that. I guess that would land you into like an Anglo Catholic spot, maybe, um, but like not anywhere else. Uh, as far as my my take on that, I think it's still not good because I don't believe that the saints in heaven can hear us. And I didn't go through any of those examples in the book. I mentioned Tertullian, Lactantius, and Augustine, who said you, that can't they can't. Um, but uh, there are quote, I got, I have a section in the book about whether or not those in heaven can hear us. Uh, and I go through a number of spots in scripture that I think demonstrate that they can't. So if you're doing that, in my view, you're uh, going against the scriptural doctrine that they can't hear us. 
Mm. That makes sense. Oh dear. Sorry, Paul. The stream seems a little hypocritical since you prayed at Saint Susan, the youth worker. It's so over, <laughs> guys. I've been exposed. I'm, I'm a total hypocrite. Saint Susan or a Pronobis. Noah, you legend, $2 uh, super chat. Good stuff. Thank you very much. We are glad you like it. I'm glad to be bringing in the uh, Lutheran contingent with this stream today. It's uh, very fun always to see them. Um, Athanasius, again, does Origin actually address prayers to saints as is claimed by the RC slash EO? Uh, address? Like the, the, mean... the topic, the, the topic oh, of does prayers he address to the, the topic? Saints. Yeah, because yeah. address could also mean yeah uh, yeah to get like to sign the prayers to the saints um, yeah as in to, to pray to saints uh oh yeah is does he does origin pray to saints no does he address the topic yes he addresses it a lot of times against celsius and on prayer are the two major works that you're going to find it and i quote augustine or I quote origin a ton in the book because not because i love origin or something but just because he says a lot on the subject there were a lot of relevant quotes from origin and he wrote a lot um and so uh, Origen is very clearly against the practice to the point where he even says we don't pray to Christ. We only pray to the Father. So, yeah, uh, yeah he, so, so he indirectly. a lot. So, so I guess I think Athanasian may have been meaning like directly that question. So you're saying by direct oh. implication, he he addresses it in that he denies it, but he doesn't, ex but it, there's nowhere that he explicitly says don't pray to saints or. Uh, no, I mean, he's really, he's really clear about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let, let me grab a. Let me see if I can find one of the uh, and while one while of the really good quotes, that, uh, do please people give a like to the stream and comment if you agree that Seth is an originist. Uh, Originism gang, Originism gang, show your faces. Where you at? Report in now. <laughs> I'm not one of you. I just want to know who to target. <laughs> um, I'm, trying to yeah. I'm trying to find a brief one that's actually like good because a lot of them are like long and it's like it clearly demonstrates this, but it's a long quote. Uh, yeah, let's no. see. There you go. Uh, here's a quote. This is from On Prayer, uh, chapter 10, page, paragraph 27. Uh, this is the translation from Will William A. Curtis, which is on CCEL, the Cl Christian Classics Ethereal Library. It's not from the Shaft set, though. Uh, it's just another public domain translation. Sure. He says, and how does it not accord with him who said, why callest you me good? None, none is good save one, God the Father. He's quoting Jesus, of course. To suppose that he would say, why pray you to me? To the Father alone ought you to pray, to whom I also pray, as indeed you learn from the Holy Scriptures, uh, etc., etc. Uh, so he says, okay, you can, only pray, you can only pray to the Father, not to Christ. And then he goes out, I'll do, I'll do the one on the invocation of angels for an example of another one. Now uh, let's see. And we are not to believe in demons, although Kelsus urges us to do. But if we are to obey God, we must die or endure anything sooner than obey demons. Uh, it, this is this is the case I was thinking of earlier. Where demons just means the general word daimon, that is like a, mm. a spirit or an angel. In the same way, we are not to propitiate demons, for it is impossible to propitiate beings that are wicked and seek the injury of men. Besides, what are the laws in accordance with Celsus that have to ha would have us propitiate the demons? Or if he means laws enacted in states, he must uh, show that they are in agreement with the divine laws, uh, etc., Okay, uh, away then with this counsel which Celsus gives, or which Celsus gives us to offer prayer to demons. It is not to be listened to for a moment, for our duty is to pray to the Most High God alone and to the Only Begotten, the firstborn of the whole creation, and to ask him as our high priest to present the prayers which ascend to him from us, to his God and our God, to his Father and the Father who, or Father of those who direct their lives according to his word. Okay, so there's one against angels. Um, and then... I only try and find another one that's specifically addressing cool. saints. If you want me to, um, really, it. really quickly, how long, how long do you have uh, to to stay with us? Uh, I mean, I got a little, I got a little. I'm not like specific on a, a short time clock sure. or anything. Sure. Yeah, I may have to limit it at around another 25 minutes or so because I'll need to move on to some other responsibilities after this. Um, so God willing, we can get through as many questions as possible. Um, sure. I think I think the quotes you gave kind of kind of give the point though. Yeah. If you want one yeah. more really quick one, yet if sure. we are to offer thanksgiving to men who are saints, how much more should we give them to Christ, who has, under the Father's will, conferred so many benefactions upon us? Yes, and intercede with him as did Stephen when he said, Lord, set not this sin against him, uh, etc. So his point there is, uh, you know, if we were to pray to saints, then how much more should we just pray to Christ instead? And then later down in the quote, 
It remains accordingly to pray to God alone, the Father of all, not, however, apart from the high priest, who has been appointed by the Father with the swearing of an oath. Mm -hmm. So he's going through the section of, okay, well, if we were to pray to saints, why wouldn't we just pray to Christ? And then he says, therefore, we should only pray to the Father. <laughs> so he, he's a little yep. extreme, but... Yeah, there, there, there are three while, of them. Yeah. There are a lot of them in the book. <laughs> right. Um, from Steve Christie, does uh, Seth, does your book cover what happens to prayers for slash two saints who might not be in heaven, i.e. presumed to be mm -hmm. in heaven, but is actually in hell? What happens to the prayer? Uh, so this would be like, yeah, what, what I mentioned those prayers earlier about like in Lutheranism, we do permit prayers saying like uh, we, we commemorate the soul of so-and-so to you that he may rest in peace. Um, I mean, uh, I, I don't know to say about like what happens to the prayers. I mean, God, God hears our prayers, um, like, uh, whether or not they're good prayers, like God hears things cause he's, he's omniscient. Um, so he hears all things. Uh, if someone's soul is, you know, actually in hell and we're commemorating them to God, uh, as a, a saint, um, I mean, I don't know what happens, I guess, um, usually this, this is done uh for like for instance the like this is usually done for the comfort of the of someone who has someone who died recently or it's done in the liturgy as something like we're commemorating uh our even like our parents our grandparents who we know died you know in their bap like to all, all our knowledge they were baptized they went to church every sunday they didn't have any obvious outward sins that you know would say that they were unrepentant they were going to communion etc you know there's no evidence that these people didn't die in the faith you know and they had christian burials you know what else are we to say uh we should have assurance they're in heaven because you know god delivers his promises so hmm. makes sense makes sense uh question did you guys watch christian wagner's refutation of francis tarleton on the intercession of the saints if so thoughts i haven't myself uh, have you seth uh if this is, the, I've not watched a video. He does have an article. I actually mentioned the article in the book. I mentioned oh. it though, specifically as something I'm not addressing because it, this is addressed to, towards the Eastern Orthodox. And his article mm -hmm. on this subject is very scholastic, um, yep. which would very, definitely would turn off like Orthodox readers. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll watch it sometime. Maybe I won't. I'm not big on this topic yet, but uh, I do love my boy Tarotin. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll defend his honor. Who knows? But no, nah, haven't seen it. Haven't seen it um any other just making sure there's no other supporter questions not all good uh doesn't ot to nt theology affect this i mean all the saints were in abraham's bosom no uh yes yeah, so this was back when we were talking about samuel i saw this one in the chat yeah th th so th that is probably um uh so i've told i've told our friends this before too I'll, I'll say it on stream i suppose i do think my section on demonstrating that the saints cannot hear us is probably the weakest part of my argument. Um, I think it's I think it's still good. I think it's still a good argument. I think that's the the position of the scripture and the early church. Um, but I could see why people would object to it for this reason because most of the scriptural support for it is Old Testament. Um, yeah. It's saying you know will they you know can the saints in heaven hear us? Uh, you know there are these passages about. Uh, you will not see the destruction of like, you'll be taken before the destruction of these people. You won't see it, things like that. Um, so there's like, there are old Testament passages about like, okay, there's a knowledge gap here. Um, so yeah, are the saints in, you know, Abraham's bosom and then get, uh, you know, the harrowing of hell and get brought up to heaven. Mm. Um, so yeah, could you make that a uh, counterpoint? I'll, I'll uh, concede it's a valid counterpoint, but you also have to demonstrate that in the New Testament that there's a change, like specifically for this thing. And I don't, I don't see any examples that prove in the New Testament that that's the case. Um, and like I said, from the early church, Tertullian, Lactantius, Augustine, all of them seem to say that they can't hear us and that there's a separation of knowledge between the worlds. Um, yeah. So even if there, it's like it's yeah, it's possible counter argument, mm -hmm. but you have to prove from the New Testament that they can hear us now, and there's yeah. no great proof for that. Yeah, that makes sense. And if I ever if I ever go over a question where you think we've answered it in the stream, then you can just refer back to that if you want, so we can just sure. smash through it. Seth, is it accurate to consider burning incense to honor someone as always a form of offering slash sacrifice? Um. So I would say that uh, if you're burning, if you're 
so if it's an honor to someone as in like like let's, let's say you hit your you're at mass and it's the the mass for you know saints peter and saint paul that's one of the masses right it's a second class feast i think anyhow it's a second class feast or something like that it might be first i forget um you know you're at that you're at that you know mass for that day yes that whole mass is in some sense in honor of that person and you might have incense during that mass but the incense should be offered to god yep. um so that would be how i would say so if, if you're offering the incense as a sacrifice to the to that saint that's problematic um if you're offering it to god and that whole like the whole ceremony the whole liturgy is the theme of you know that particular saint and it's their saint day that's totally good yeah yeah i'd, I'd agree with that as well I, i'd agree that incense the whole point of incense is sacrifice like i uh, to give my own self personal example i started more recently i have a little thrill here that actually a friend uh, gave me as like a birthday gift a couple of years ago as well as a bag of frankincense and coals and i'm now using it a bit more frequently these days to because i have like there's there's issues i've dealt with with like uh, discipline with actually getting work done in that including with the channel there you go. There's your man. There He's you. got there's, one as there's well. There's my thurible. I can't point. There you go. There it is. There's my thurible up there. Absolutely. You see hey, that you do this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, I like to now more recently, I like to use it uh, in order to get me a mindset into like get down, get to work, no laziness. Um, but I like to do it because I, I light up, I light up my incense and I'll I even like sense my PC if it sounds a little bit LARPing. Um, but I do it because I consider that the work I do, it is it is a sacrificial worship to God. That's why I'm doing all this. And so if if you got you got to think about it with incense, if anyone was to think it's somehow not a sacrifice, I don't think anyone does. But in case there's that odd person out there, um, if you're burning incense, but it's not a sacrifice to God, what is it? You're trying to get higher frankincense or something like, well, what's the purpose? You know, <laughs> so yeah, I'd, I'd say 100% agree. It is sacrifice, burning incense. Um, far away, are getting a lot of comments uh, very fast. Chris G says, have to go. We'll watch the rest later. Thanks again for the thought-provoking stream, Paul and Seth. Not convinced, but we'll look into a more probs by your book. Legendary. Thanks, yeah, for, thanks for coming here, Chris. Um, and for the next question, <laughs> Jade Sire said that Justin Marta believed everything Jade Iyer believes. Are you telling me this isn't true? Invocation of deceased souls? <laughs> <laughs> Jay Dyer believes the exact same thing as the apostles. Yeah, absolutely. He is the apostles. <clears throat> Lutheran Hub. How would you respond to Chris G's point on Samuel not being heaven at the time of the necromancy? Samuel was in Hades and had yet to be liberated from it by Christ. Yeah, so that's the same one as earlier. We talked about the sure. Old Testament. Uh, you know, they're in Sheol instead. Too easy. Yeah. Yeah. Same. It's, it's Yeah, it's a valid, a valid uh, counterpoint. We have to demonstrate there's a change in the New Testament and you have to address the Old Testament uh, or you have to address the church father witness too. Sure. Yep. Horace asks again, uh, ignore if this was brought up, but if there is priest, is there precedent for prayers for the dead from Hebrews 12, 24 to 20, uh, 22 to 24, but you have come to Mount Zion, et cetera, being different from the old Testament, the Mount that can be touched. Uh, I don't know what this past is. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm fine with prayers for the dead. So I'm if, if that is um if that's a another passage to support it, great, I guess. Um I don't know what that passage is. I can look it up real quick. But um oh. I don't know. I mean if it's uh, prayers for the, the dead, it, then it's kind of a moot point. Yeah, it's kind of a moot point. It's prayers yeah. for the dead is not the same as to them. Uh if you want the passages that typically used, second Maccabees, of course, with the the mm -hmm. the dead people and the warriors. The other example is Onias, who or not Onias, um Onesiphorus, who it seems like he's probably dead in the passage, and uh, Paul says to pray for him. So yeah, it's not clear though. Is. But there's also really early church witness to it, very mm -hmm. early second century witness. Yep. How would you respond to the standard uh, Eastern soundbite of quote? It was criticizing when pagans do it. It was not talking about the Christian <laughs> practice. Um, I mean, you still have to get around like the origin stuff saying we pray alone to the father and things like that and you yeah. still have to get around the nature of prayer and the fathers where they all define prayer as something that's to god yeah you have to get around the stuff where they say don't exceed the lord's prayer which obviously doesn't have invocation of yeah. saints and, and actually the lord's prayer has further stuff like it has stuff in it that you can only pray to god can you ask saints for forgiveness of sins no yeah. and can you ask saints for, or can you tell saints thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever no Regardless of whether that's in the original text or not, it's obviously a very early church practice uh, to yeah. say that uh, 
to say that at the end. Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah, you can't say those things to saints, so you, but you can say them to God, and that's the closest thing we have to a definition of prayer. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, there's all these and, other things that like corroborate with their message against the pagans. So like you have to like kind of ignore those to say, oh, it's not talking about the Christian practice. Well, they define the Christian practice, and it's not invoking saints. Yes. And I believe was it was it Augustine you said who said you don't pray to demons or to good angels? Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. That's what Augustine, Augustine said. That part you don't pray to angels. Yeah, good. You don't pray to demons or good angels. Um, there's also passages like in the Opus Imperfectum, the incomplete work of Matthew, that says like we don't pray to heavenly kings, uh, who you know it seems like probably good, but he says we don't pray to them. So you know, clearly it's not that, just talking about. Say that again. Uh, don't pray to heavenly kings. Or sorry, not heavenly kings. Uh, we don't pray to kings in heaven. I think is the word to use. Well, kings me, in heaven, or maybe let me get the wording exactly. Because or if that or maybe it's great accurate. kings, it's something along those lines. Where because if, if that is referencing quote heavenly or kings in heaven or whatever, that'd be actually pretty massive for a little personal theology project I have of mine. If but, I can yeah. find it, I'll I'll get it. <laughs> It's in the Opus Imperfectum, though, uh, yep. which is incomplete work on Matthew. Sure, too easy. Um, I, I guess we can move on. I can look at that later. Uh, okay, so, peccatori justificatus. Was there considerable opposition to the practice of invocation of the saints when it became mainstream, especially throughout the Middle Ages? Um, so, the, the, the Franks is the... Rel oh, so... Yes, there is. Depends who you define considerable, I suppose. Do you count the 8th century Franks and 9th century Franks to be considerable? Um, if you do, then yeah. I mean, there's, I, we went through some of the examples. There's clearly a opposition against this, um, especially Einhard, who's like, Einhard is very clearly doesn't like, doesn't really know of the practice much. He like, he's heard of it. And even the people he's heard of it, it seems uncertain language. So he's clearly like not something he sees as an apostolic or universal practice at all. I um, mean, that's, you know, that's, like I said, that's 700s, 800s. Um, that's definitely Middle Ages. Uh, there's also the, I go through the proto-Protestants in the book, the Waldensians, mm. the Lollards, and the Hussites. I only have a tiny section on them because most people don't care about that very much. So I just gave it a couple. Um, it doesn't, they all, they're all they all against it. Um, what's actually kind of notable is that the year that the council, the second council of Nicaea finally gets like a, the stamp of approval in the West, like across the board, is in 1140 AD, which is way after Council Second Council of Nicaea. Uh, Second Council of Nicaea is 780 or 787, I believe. And this is 1140 is when it finally gets the full stamp of approval from the West. That's the same year that Peter Waldo is born, and the Wald he starts the Waldensian uh, sect. Whether or not they're Orthodox is a different story, but um, sure. there's uh, there's opposition from the Proto Protestants at that in the you know High Middle Ages and Late Middle Ages. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, would Matthew 18, 10 justify praying to your guardian angel? Interesting question. So I right, here this is this is one of the trickiest ones. Um, so a guardian angel probably can actually, you know, interact with the interact with things around me because it's your guardian angel. I do believe in guardian angels because I think there are actually quite a few scripture passages that seem to speak about something along that lines. The, ex the exact details are difficult to work out, but there seems to be something along the lines of guardian angels in the New in the New Testament and the early church. Um, and even in Luther's prayers in the catechism, let your holy angel be with me. Um, so clearly seems to be a thing. Uh, so that would be the argument where I say, okay, they might actually be able to hear you. The question is, however. Oh, no, freeze at the worst possible time. No, we're not going to get the answer, guys. It's so over. Invocation is now. proven. All right, we're back. <laughs> um, yeah, so your, your, your guardian angel or whatever, guardian angels, plural, whatever it is exactly. Um, can probably hear you, but the question is, does the Bible say you can only pray to God and does it define prayer as worship? And I say yes to both those questions, and I I think I demonstrate that well in the book. And so yeah. I'd still say you can't pray to them because even if they can hear you, you couldn't uh, pray to them in that way. But I think maybe you could say like, okay, could you ask them to pray for you? Like you ask a friend to pray for you. So you could, you could, could you ask your guardian angel to do that? Maybe that'd be like the exception to the rule. I don't cover that in the book. That'd be like a fringe example where it's like, okay, you could ask your guardian angel to pray for you. Like you can ask a friend to pray for you. Mm -hmm. I suppose yeah. there's no command to uh, for that in scripture, which makes me hesitant. 
because I don't like Lutherans are sometimes accused of being in the camp where it's like, well, if it's not forbidden, we can do it. But that's not really our historic position. We don't really, we really try to keep our worship within the lines of scripture in our opinion. Um, I think uh, verbally, we actually are in a decent agreement with the reformed on that, even if it plays out very differently in how our liturgy works from traditional reformed. Yep, that's right. That's right. Uh uh, Horace again, the Greek word proskuneo, which translates as worship, isn't exclusively used for God in all contexts. See Revelation 3.9. The same word uh, proskunesusin is used for God, Revelation 15.4. Thoughts? 3.9. I have to check these passages. Sure. I'm almost positive. I went through press the lexicons on this topic. Mm -hmm. Unless I yeah. just missed one somehow, but I didn't think I did. 3.9. This passage is, indeed, I will make those. Oh, okay. I thought he was just doing a meme for a second. <laughs> I will, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. He's saying that this isn't used for God in that Exclusively. spot? Exclusively, yeah. How is that not worship to God in that spot? I just read the passage, right? Did, did I mean, I guess because it that? says proskuneo before your feet. Um, but uh, I think the question could be asked then, is proskuneo actually being used in a religious context there? Because it is it is a bowing motion. So it could just be showing how like, oh, like they're pleading for mercy or whatever. So they proskuneo. Oh, before oh I, I see what he's saying. Um. I mean, yeah, you could you could make an argument that doesn't always exclusively translate as worship and all yep. in that specific spot, I suppose. Yep. Um, but in general, the question is, in the spots where, where it's prayer, is it only done to God or not? And it is yep. only done to God. Um, and But for me as well, though, this, and this is kind of what I alluded to a little bit earlier, I kind of have a big theology project of mapping out biblical theology of worship, including the particulars of actions. And my large running theory that I've been that I've uh, derived from Holy Scripture so far is that um, the worship is related to the context in the concept of dominion. So if someone has dominion over something, you're within that, then you do in some sense worship them. Um, and so uh, uh, prayers to and worship of even in a light sense of other gods slash saints slash angels. Uh, is wrong because they're in God's exclusive domain, which he has taken entirely for himself, which the Old Testament goes on uh, ad nauseum about that. But um, God has appointed humanly vice regents on the earth in the form of kings, princes, and so forth. And that's why um, while you see condemnation of bowing and serving other gods or angels or what have you, because they're in the heavenly domain, you see them referenced as perfectly permissible and normal towards kings, for example, or human authorities. So that's kind of my working theory. And so um, that would perfectly fit with this uh, Revelation 3 9 ju just fine. Yep. Um, okay. Do you go over pre Nicene catacomb inscriptions in your book? I think that was the one that we went over. Uh, yeah. The Memoria Apostolorum at Ad, at Ad Catacumbas. Well, that might not be pre Nicene. Uh, maybe it is. Right. Maybe it isn't. Um, there are no pre Nicene catacomb. There are no catacombs that are for sure before Nicaea 1 that have invocation of saints okay um the earliest one is that memorial apostolorum which is probably i mean it's a pretty big date range 244 to 356 may or may not be before nicaea hard to say makes sense makes sense all right a couple more than i'll need to hit it um personally i reject the mary of rome as i reject the isa of islam as not the son of god but another how do you take mary as represented by rome eh, a bit of oh. bit bit tangential a little here, bit off. So. I actually kind of want to do you want to answer one of these ones that about the apology the augsburg confession by truth is beautiful uh um, yeah yeah sure um actually where where is that is that one of the latest ones or 9 21 p.m nine or one at 9 20 also works too either either one. Oh, i guess that's uh, right uh australia time um uh, yeah bad. yeah different time how, how far back roughly uh you know 10 messages up it says, up. but but you can only pray in faith, so you couldn't pray in faith. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly say this anyway. I I do think they have a very blasphemous view of Mary. So I yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I agree. Some, I think there's some demonic stuff behind. The... And I have a high view of Mary. And I, yeah, I don't that's it. Mary. Yeah. Like my church, my church has all the Marian feast days and everything, and I have an icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help up there, and you know. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Truth is beautiful. Uh, 
Defense yeah, of the Augsburg Confession, Melanchthon says that we can only pray in faith without a command or example from Scripture. We cannot pray in faith. Yeah, so oh, this is this is something I, I just totally like, slipped my mind when I wrote the book. So I actually want to address this because it's something I like, just forgot about. That's actually the main argument in the Augsburg Confession and the Apology is that we can only pray things that we know are for sure, that we have assurance in. Because a big theme in the New Testament is that when we pray, we have assurance that it's answered. That's like a ton of times in the New Testament, especially First John um about having a sure advocate with the father things like that it's all very clearly about assurance and so if you even if you could provide some sort of support for this doctrine of invocation you you, you still be able to do it in line with the scriptural idea that you should have assurance of what's you're praying mm. like you should have assurance that god's going to hear you and answer you so if you want to like fit it into the framework it's just not going to work because there's right. no there's no solid ground to base this doctrine. There's all like these like little shifting pieces that people can try and pull up, but no good ground of assurance. And that applies to the guardian angels too, which I think is that what that was responding to, um, in particular. So yeah, there's no there's no assurance that guardian angels will hear us. So we really right. shouldn't do that. Makes sense. So uh, you forgot the main argument of your tradition in your book. Impressive. Very nice. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's funny because I cited all the passages too, and I just totally forgot the actual argument being made. I like forgot <laughs> to put it in the book. <laughs> right. What did Luther say about devotion to Theot to the Theotokos and saints and angels? Uh, devotion? Uh, he says high things about the devotion. He maintained the a lot of the feast days and things like that. I mean, so did the later Lutherans and so did the Lutherans today. I mean, pick up a treasury or daily prayer from CPH, pick up a an LSB or a TLH from, you know, Lutheran, you know, pick one up from Concordia Publishing House and you'll see the saints days in there. Yep. Um, LSB, so yeah, we, we maintain the saints days. Not to be confused with Legacy oh. Standard Bible. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Lutheran Service Book, uh, or the 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 Lutheran Hymnal TLH, you know, or Treasury Daily Prayer, the TDP. You, those are all Lutheran sources. You pick one up, and you'll see all the you'll see all the feast days in them. So yeah, we we, we maintain devotion, but we just uh, don't invoke them. Yeah, fair enough. Um, what do you make of the angel in Revelation that casts the prayers of the saints on earth and so forth? This is one of the standard texts, of course. Uh, my answer is that it shows that the saints and angels in heaven pray for us. Yeah. And that's all it shows. <laughs> it doesn't show that they can hear us or that we should pray to them. Yep, that's it. Horace, do you think Psalm 45 had an immediate context? Matthew Henry rejects this likely because it was venerating an earthly man, your throne, O oh God. What? I don't know if I know this passage, so I don't know if I'm having a great answer. That's like quick. Mm -hmm. I have to like look at it uh let's see i don't know you didn't give me a verse number either so i'm trying to skim through it but fair enough oh your throne of god is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom uh is this christ Presume. uh oh froze again the the jesuits oh, trying to stop darn. us again uh <laughs> yeah this is this is christ i mean just like just the next thing in the verse therefore your god has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions all your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia who is anointed with myrrh and aloes and cassia on the grave on out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad king's daughters are among your honorable women at your right hand stands the queen in gold from ophir now i obviously this is a if you're anything it's a marian direction which you could totally do honestly but uh i who, who is that uh this is talking about christ so i don't know what to say further than that it's an earthly man um it seems like it's talking about God. Makes sense. Makes sense. And we've gone through all the questions that I was able to find, which is awesome. So we'll look at this very final one. If invocation false, <laughs> why ask friend to pray? Got you there, Who man. Knows? If God real, why ocean? <laughs> if God oh, real, that was on atheist takes earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> if God real, why stub too? But yes. So I think that, ladies and gentlemen, is all for today. So Seth, mate, you absolute legend. Thank you so much for coming on today. Absolute pleasure. Super meaty stream. Got through a lot in a relatively speaking short amount of time. Um, so give us all the plugs that you want um, before we finish. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, if you can pick up the book on Amazon or Lulu. Um, Lulu, it gives, Amazon takes a big cut. I make like a dollar off of an Amazon sale. Um Lulu, I make like I think seven bucks or something like that. So if I, uh, if you can buy off Lulu, I, I suggest it. But I understand if you if you're convenience, you want to get off Amazon too. That's fine. Um, if you don't mind, uh, you know Bezos taking the cut. Uh, so yeah, against the invocation of saints, uh, check out Scholastic Lutherans. Uh, that's the YouTube channel. Uh, we're also on most podcasting platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all those. 
Um, we're on Twitter at Gerhard's Ghost. Um, it's mo that's usually just me commenting on random threads. I don't. It's not like a ton of active stuff in there <laughs> on Twitter. And um, you can also find my blog, uh, Confessing Lutheran. Uh, that's a WordPress blog, confessinglutheran.home.blog. Um, I don't post a ton on there, but you can you know read my old posts or random things I happen to put up on there. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Excellent, excellent. And do remember, people, you can purchase the book in the links in the description down below. You can find it immediately there and uh, help our friend Seth out here spread the good word against the invocation of the saints. So, Seth, thank you so much. Everybody, thank you all for watching, giving your questions, and God willing, being educated by this excellent stream, and hopefully even further educated by Seth's book, should you choose to buy it. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Seth from Scholastic Lutherans. This has been The Other Paul. I hope you all had a lovely day or evening. God bless.